the, this week is boot camp week. It's all crazy back to back to back. And then next couple months, I'll just do one every once in a while. Yeah. Cause I'm going to run out of friends really quick here. <laughs> <laughs> and the last two podcasts, we talked about this mysterious guy named Chris the whole time. Yeah, well, when Chris borrowed, and no one's going to really know what we're talking about, so oh. it's good you're here so we could... Oh, that's funny. Yeah, Christopher, Chris, or when Corey says blood all the time. So, <laughs> same person. And I realized two things. One, I say like all the time, so I'm trying not to do that. It's really hard. Yeah. I watch myself as I talk, so it feels like I'm really stilted when I talk, but it slows me down. So yeah. I don't just go like, and then like, 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 it gets really <laughs> annoying. And John kept saying, you know... So it's really a lot of cool things you learn about yourself when you listen back to three hours of dialogue. Mm -hmm. It's kind of scary, actually. I did that. I did that teaching once where I put a, I put a video camera up and you recorded just, yourself teaching. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cause there's, and everybody has their crutch there. There are certain things they do. If it's a mannerism or something like you do, or like what do you do with your hands? You yeah. Know? Well, in what I, I found is I always like, you know, you know, like mm -hmm. I would, I would try to get somebody to like confirm it, you know, what I was saying. And I didn't like that. It didn't look good. It almost feels, what do you think that is? Cause I was doing, you know what I'm talking, you know what I'm saying? Or I did never say, you know what I'm saying or anything like yeah. that. But I think it's a way of trying to really capture somebody's attention and make sure they're listening. Yeah. Especially as a teacher. Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, I think so. Are, are we going by the way, or, or are we, yeah. have we actually started? Or I just, literally just go. Yeah. And I find a good starting point to start it. So you don't do like an introduction or anything? No, like that, this, yeah. I want it to be like, I would, we'd be talking anyway. Yeah. And it just happens to capture it because every time I talk to people, I've been talking to people. I've realized it ever since I started teaching guitar a lot of our lessons just become half hour conversations. Oh yeah. And I thought if I could just record some of these, I would have had some great podcasts, especially with people that are in the business and everything. But even students that don't have anything to do with music, they want to talk about life stuff. And I always think we had a big breakthrough today and nothing captured it. It's all just in our minds. Sure. So this is kind sure. of fun. And then Corey's podcast was funny because when it ended, we just stood up and kind of walked out. It was like a fade out or something. Oh, really? So it's going to be completely <laughs> it, pro, but not pro. It's, hopefully it sounds pro the way yeah. it, with the microphones and stuff, yeah. but I don't really care if it has a beginning and end and all that. Yeah. Maybe a theme song someday. Cause that'd be sort of funny if I didn't have music. Oh yeah. Well, heck you could do something really simple, easy. I was thinking just about to, it. Yeah. But there's a lot of pressure because what do you do for an intro that encapsul encapsulate, encapsulates what it's, I don't even know. This is such a wide open podcast. It's not about music necessarily. Yep. It's, it's just the art of life. And the only reason I called it that is because somebody suggested it off the art of guitar, which makes a lot of sense to tie them together because they're both under my umbrella. So yeah. plus having all the subscribers, it's fun to be able to have an audience right away. Sure. If I had to start over, I'd have probably 10 subscribers. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and if you have a lot of subscribers and you want a, a guest to come in and, and do this and they're not sure whether or not it's legit. At least you have a number to say, well, this many people you have access to. And maybe they'll, maybe it'll pressure them to come yeah. in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But like I said, I just wanted to finally show people who this guy was that we kept talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's funny. I don't know. That's the best part of this. We don't have to talk about music or anything. Yeah. People were writing in questions for Corey and John, but we would start answering it and we would just end up talking about movies. Right. I saw you oh. posted something, but that was just a little bit ago. Nobody probably even you know why? posted anything. I did that for two straight days now. Ask questions from my guests, but I never release the podcast. So I think they finally give up. They're just thinking, oh. well, they're not going to answer it anyway. Even oh, though sure. we did. Once I release it, I'll all be out there. <laughs> But we we're getting a lot of questions about how you started in music. Right. Where, why did you pick the instrument you chose and how you ended up where you are now? Yeah. So that might be a good place to go for you. Sure. Did you want any? No, I'm good. Okay. I got my Diet 7. <laughs> Corey and I talked about Diet Pop for, I think, a half hour. Really? How it's bad for you? He got, well, he found out he had type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. After, I think, a year or so of opening his restaurant, because he stocked uh, Coke Zero, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. And he was thinking, what's the difference between Diet Coke and Coke Zero? And he got really addicted to Coke Zero, finding out later that, like any Diet Pop, it's not 
diet in a certain sense, if you still, I think if it's, if you, no matter what, even if it's just diet pop, it's not that much better for you, but what's the difference? Just no calories? No sugar. sugar. But what is it replace? What do they replace it with? With, with like aspartame or something like that. The shit that kills me. Yeah. Right. So that's the thing though. But for somebody that has, has diabetes or something, it's, it's like a big help. Yeah. Cause like, you know, a certain amount of sugar you're supposed to have. One can of pop is like way over the carbs that you're supposed to have in a day. It's you know? scary to read labels when you have to start reading them. Yeah. You go, that many carbs in a, a small, the smallest thing. And then you look at the serving size. Yeah. And you're thinking, who eats only that much? Yeah. So if it wasn't diet 7-Up, how many 7-Ups could you have to equal that one can? Or how many diet 7-Ups could you have that would equal one regular 7-Up sugar-wise? Well, there's no sugar in here. So, so it doesn't even like so, trick your body. Anymore. Yeah. Okay. So, so like on here, the total carbs zero. So, mm. so according to, if that's what, you know, I mean, there's different issues. Like someday I'm sure we're going to, we, there's already, there's, there's all these studies and you're going to find out, well, aspartame is bad for you. If you they already have many, that study. Yeah. Yeah. Like all that stuff is there. But at the same time, if you're like, fighting sugar and you already have like you're addicted to sweetness it's like diet pop is is at least a i think at least a way to at least you know throw you into a different direction to maybe um that's a good way to put it cut it down you know it's not a it's not i don't think i mean anything in excess you know is is bad for you i think but. even too much water i yeah. heard about a lady who died drinking too much water oh, trying gosh. to win a playstation on a contest <laughs> so she drank i think it was three gallons of water and died that's crazy yeah because the opposite thing happens that washes away they said this i don't know if it's true electrolytes that you need to have your brain electro the electricity in your body to function yeah and she washed it all out and died oh my gosh to win a playstation that's weird. So don't do that. Yeah, no kidding. But it's funny like the way you say diet seven up is sort of a gateway to getting into a healthier way. I like that. It's like a it's a bridge yeah. to finally getting off regular sugar, I guess. Yeah. Into this weird chemical world yeah. of aspartame. And you know about my gum thing, right? Where I yeah, just right. and give it up and all all of a sudden all my joints stopped hurting. I thought I was just getting old. Yeah. I'd get be sore for two weeks after working out and I thought, what is wrong with me? I guess I'm just getting old. Went in went and started chewing spry just because it said it had something different in it, which they'll probably find out is bad too. Sure. Just like everything. Yeah. And so what do you do? Just yeah. I try to just drink water and whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Sugar is a crazy thing though. It's like, I don't have problems with drugs or alcohol or anything, but sugar. Is you never, just, even you know. drinking back when we had all the access we wanted to drugs or drinking. Yeah. I, besides the weird, crazy story, a couple of stories we have, you never got addicted to anything. Right. No, it's just, but it just runs in my family. It's like sweet tooth, you know, just in just carbs. Yeah. The tricky part is I'm just learning more about it, but it's like. The tricky part is just understanding because your body needs carbs. I mean, mm-hmm. that's carbs are energy. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, is if you're somebody that overloads on them, then it it doesn't know what to do with the rest of it. So that's where your body goes just, all crazy. Just, just store it up. Yeah, it just stores it, and then and then and then it's just stuffs just it starts shutting stuff down. You know, like it's that's just scary. crazy. Yeah. When so, you say shutting down, you mean it's because your body's pumping so much insulin to combat it? I think so. I, I don't know enough about it. I'm kind of trying to learn more about it, but I know like your blood flow and your in your limbs go bad, your feet can go bad, your eyes can eyesight can go bad. That's and, all diabetes related. And, mm-hmm. So people get numbness in their fingers. It could either fingers ugh. and toes. That's always a scary thing. People no actually what. have to get their feet like toes amputated. Um, yeah, it's just, I mean, people can actually lose their eyesight Damn. and you can, it, yeah, it's, it's a really, really bad thing. Yeah. I, I told, I think it was Pepke that four of my friends got type two diabetes within three months of each other. From what I remember them at least telling me that they yeah, had it. Right. And I was thinking, what is happening? And it, it was like a scary movie. All of a sudden, all your best friends, all the, these people, you know, yeah. And type two is the kind you give yourself, right? I believe so. Type yeah. one, you're just born with it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's easy these days. We're all raised. Corey was talking about this too. 
all raised on sweet stuff. Yeah. And we'd go to Hardee's and I ate a Frisco burger every day for yeah. lunch on during 12th grade. And yeah. remember what was for school lunch? Pizza and fries were the most accessible thing. And I'm sure they had healthy it's options. Unbelievable. But, yeah. yeah. And they had pop machines, I believe, in the yeah. lunchroom at the time. What yeah. Did, when you really start, when you start like getting aware and looking at what's in the ingredients and you go, okay. I mean, there's other things because other, you know, some people have cholesterol issues and, yeah. and other things too. But if it's just, if you're trying to cut out sugar and carbs, all of a sudden you look at it and you're like, oh my gosh, it's like almost everything I eat is like carb overload. You know, I mean, if you take a sandwich and you just get normal white bread, sure. that's like I two slices white. of bread is like, the entire allotment of carbs that you should have in a day, you know? <laughs> Two pieces of toast and you're done yeah, for the day. Yeah, to- exactly. <laughs> Damn. I mean, now there's other types of bread that you can get that can sure. cut that way down. But we were raised on Wonder Bread. Yeah. <laughs> and that's basically sugar paste turned into bread, oh, I think. Yeah. But yeah. it was so good as a kid, you'd make grilled cheese sandwiches that, like, the cheap, uh, we did at least, the cheap Velv- or, uh, slices, and we'd... I don't know. It was just eating yeah. sugar mixed with fat. And I think yeah. that's where the problem is. Nowadays, there are fat diets. They found out fat doesn't make you fat, which seems weird. But it's yeah. if you start to look at keto diets and mm-hmm. the ones where you change your body's fuel source, no longer is it carbs, but it's just fats and protein. Mm. And some people... Like an Atkins kind of diet. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. I remember when we first heard about it, it was at A440 and Johnny got on it and he mm. lost 40 pounds or yeah, something crazy. That. Yeah. And I was thinking, what is he doing that has to be revolutionary? Because he's fine. He wasn't acting like really sickly yeah. or anything else and he was really skinny again. But that has its drawbacks. I think if you slip up, it's easy to go right back to where Ooh, yeah. you were. That, I think that's that's what I because I've gone down that road. I I did the Atkins diet for a while, and I remember I that was a year that I got so sick too. It was like all of a sudden, I don't know if it was related, but also I mean I had like the flu twice, and, mm. and it was just odd, you know. And, um, but I lost a bunch of weight quick, and for a while, like the first week, you feel really down, and then all of a sudden, you get more energy after that. There's a thing called the keto flu. I wonder if it's the same thing where your body's trying to change over to the other fuel source. Mm. So you are you just get sick. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. But what I found is anything extreme I don't think is healthy, you know, so mm. because you can, you can trick yourself to doing anything for a certain period of time, but eventually you're going to go away from it. You yeah. Know? And that's, that's where I've kind of decided it's like, you know, I think, I mean, I'm kind of at a point where I like the Adkins thing. Like, I feel like I should go down that route just to get a little bit back into shape, you know, and then figure out, okay, how can you introduce some of these things? But almost everybody I've seen do like a no carb diet. Like they, they, they go lose weight and then you see them a year later and they've, they've put it all back plus some, you know? Yeah. It's sort of like pulling back the slingshot. You pull it back yeah. further and further and you let it go and it really flies. <clears throat> but yeah. I also was thinking about the elimination diet. This guy, a lot of people were doing that where they cut out everything except for one type of food. And it sounds crazy, but the carnivore diet, have you heard of that? No. Just steaks. That's all yeah. you eat, steak and yeah. hamburger and all that. And this, a lot of people find relief from it because they didn't realize something they were eating before was messing up, up whether it was grains or greens or whatever. And so they get rid of everything except for one source. And I think meat's a good thing if you're only going to have one thing yeah. because the animals will eat vegetables sure. and you get through that and stuff. But if you're somebody that fights cholesterol issues, you, that, you'd go through the roof with that. You'd think so. Yeah. But the studies on a few people showed that that's – everyone's different. Their body will react to things. Some people go – high protein and you're right it totally screws them up yeah other people do it and i think it's when you go that route but you still somehow in like your body's uh reaction this is all bro science because i don't know what i'm talking about but i just see results yeah. from people yeah and i found out that a lot of people that do the low low or no carb thing they binge still once in a while and that's almost suicide because your body now is looking for that new fuel source then you pump the old stuff in and you know what it's like to quit something that's really bad for you for a while and then have a little bit of it again and you're just so you feel the full effect of it. Oh yeah. 
uh, quitting sugar for a couple months. I had a massive headache, and then I had one sweet thing, and I felt like I took drugs. Oh, yeah. I was like, this is the full effect of sugar. Or you don't really drink coffee, do you? No. But the same with coffee. If you quit coffee and then you have one, it's the best thing you've ever had. (laughs) That's why, like, the first time you have any weed, it well, maybe the first time it doesn't always seem to work on people. But when it really hits you the first time, they always say you're chasing that feeling forever. Yeah. I'm thinking I'm glad I didn't go down that road. Some people need that every day just to get out of bed. And it's got to be tough to keep that up. Yeah. Well, for me, the carbs, not having carbs, the biggest issue is, is not having that super stuffed feeling that we're so used to like carbs like carbs do yeah it's like you know you go to a restaurant and if you if you leave not like i mean this is just how i grew up it's like you go to a restaurant and when you leave you have to like be like achy and like (laughs) and and barely be able to walk out because that's how you get your money's worth and that that's just clear your plate yeah it's just like the american way you know where but then when you like you go to the doctor and you start talking about portion size and all that stuff and you look at like yeah you can have pasta and then they show you this little bowl full of the <laughs> pasta like the, the amount that you should have and it's like seven noodles yeah yeah <laughs> and you're like oh my gosh i mean that's kind of tough for our american way because if you went if you went to a restaurant and got the proper portion that you should get we would never go back to that restaurant because we feel like we got ripped off. Totally. Yeah, it's it's really tough, you know? Sometimes you go to a nice Italian place and they put it on the center of this big bowl plate. You ever go to an yeah. Italian place? Yep. And it doesn't look like much, but it really is when it finally, when you start yeah. eating it. But you feel a little gypped. Or if you yeah. get, this is so first world, <laughs> a nice filet or something, and it yep. comes in like a, a circle, mm-hmm. a little round, what do they call that? Medallion or whatever. Mm-hmm. Petite and filet. You're like thinking, that's it? Where's ouncer? the baked potato? Where's the all the sides? <laughs> oh, yeah. But by the time, at least lately when I've been getting it, I've been trying to do low carb. I just eat that and I wait a while or I drink a lot of water with it. Yeah. I feel good. But I think we just have to change the definition of full. Like you said, the American way is I can't get back in my car. I could barely walk to my car after yeah. I eat. But it's funny when you actually do. That's why it's nice to have a hobby where you have to exert a lot of like jujitsu for me, if I would have been full and gone there, I would have thrown up. So I'm always worried. Do I still have a little bit of space inside where I can function and move? If not, I can't do the things I want to do, Yep. but changing the way you feel to feel full. That's a weird thing. Yeah. You're fighting your entire life. Like every time you go out to eat Thanksgiving. Yep. I don't know if you notice this, but do you get a, can you ever catch a cold or get really sick after Thanksgiving or Christmas or anywhere where you have a big dinner and booze and all that? Mm, I don't think I've experienced that. A lot of times I'd get sick around holidays just because your body knows that, uh, like if you're going, 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 doing a whole bunch of stuff and then you finally get some days off, also my it's like my body will go, oh, you've got a break right now. Time you're getting it. sick. <laughs> you I used have to time happen to, to me a sick. lot. Yeah. And do you think it's related to having these huge meals and being I, I don't think so because well for me I didn't feel that way because it was I'd get sick before the meals okay. like like for multiple years Thanksgiving for some reason I'd I'd get sick on like before Thanksgiving the morning of Thanksgiving weird sick. yeah but I think I think it's more like stress related more of like just working doing going 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 and maybe not eating healthy up to that point and then all of a sudden your body just goes yep i got you you know <laughs> so you're feeling sick and then you know you have to go to the big function and still be social i think or... it's more related to my body knows that i have work off for a couple of days during the, those times so it's good at least your body stays strong while it yeah, needs to be you know it's not as i haven't really had knock on wood that kind of stuff for quite some time, but for a while there, when I was really going, 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 like it would just be like clockwork, you know, like my Christmas break or something, I would always get. That sucks. Flu. You can't look forward to holidays because yeah. you know, you're going to be, <laughs> you just want to go home and go to bed. Yeah. I remember when we lived together and we would basically live off Tylenol sinus. Do you remember that? Oh, yeah. I still carry some of my pocket. I was going to say, I used to have to always have one in my pocket. So I had an inhaler in one pocket. And then that one time your sister left her juicer behind. And that's when my health revolution came. I think you remember that. Oh, yeah. And it was bad. because Yeah, because. (laughs) (laughs) But you also remember I made that contraption to catch a. Yep. Remember that cone? The rolled paper, yeah. I feel bad. I wish I could apologize (laughs) for all that. But I started juicing every night 
carrots and all this mm-hmm. stuff. And by oh. the way, juicing fruits like I was doing is no better than drinking pop as far as I know. Cause yeah. it's still sh- a sugar spike yep. and your body's still like, what the hell? All the sugar yeah. at once. You're not supposed to drink nine oranges at right. once, but it was, I guess it put me on the right path. So it felt felt good like I was going the right direction or whatever. So, but then yeah, all the stuff stayed in the garbage disposal. Oh yeah. And next yeah. thing you know, <laughs> the flies started fruit flies come and came and yeah. I actually looked up how to build a trap for them and that was gross too because you'd have a what was it like a glass container with a cone in it and all of a sudden there was a billion yeah, fruit flies it was, trying it was to like get a out. craft, you know, like yeah, that's what it was. Or whatever, yep. Yeah. And yeah. It's such an easy thing to make. You just take paper and make a cone kind of tape it so there's no way to get out of the sides and then they crud on the hole because you put like a rotting to uh rotting apple or yeah, something yep. inside it was an apple. they all crawl something in sweet. yep and they can't get out and you feel bad <laughs> it was funny one time i had that carafe full of it felt like it was buzzing like it was oh yeah bees. and i went to throw it outside and right before i got to the front door i oh. kind of tripped a little bit <laughs> and the cone came out and it was this cloud Flying of everywhere it was so terrible oh, but after yeah. another day of the cone they're they're so dumb oh. they just go right back in those things used to make me itch all over the place, just like just seeing them. You're like, nice, <laughs> nice roommate. You bring the flies, you bring that no. I was cooking those gross uh, yeah. Korean foods and stuff. Uh, sorry. No. I think, but I think juicing is good if you're somebody that's not fighting with sugar issues. Sure. You know? Well, vegetable but, juicing is great because yeah. I hate eating vegetables. So oh, just yeah. Drinking one quick glass. Yeah. It's way better. Drinking celery is pretty nasty. Oh, though. yeah. I could, you know. I've, I've been finding steamed vegetables is like so good. You've done that yeah. a while. Yeah. Do you do yeah. that when you barbecue still or? Yeah. Okay. Do that. You know, that's the thing. It's like, if I, if I can find the right thing, I'll go into streaks of just like, if you can have like a chicken breast yes. and some steamed broccoli and you eat that regularly, I mean, there's no carbs in that. Like if for somebody that's fighting sugar, mm-hmm. it's like, you can eat that for days, yep. you know, and not, and it won't. Eating clean. Yeah, yeah, eating clean. Yeah. So I don't know. But well, ultimately, my issue is exercise. You know, I don't, it, it's like. That's why we got to get back into tennis. Yeah, I know. It's just the whole exercise thing. It's like you could talk about everybody's diet, but, and whatever people are having problems, but if they all find, ultimately, if we all found some way to exercise, it would cure most of that those problems you know i have a lot of friends who have that same issue they just feel that they think of exercise and they just go oh yeah but you didn't feel that way when you're in the middle of a match or even playing table tennis ping pong i played against my brother i don't know if i saw the video i did see that and after you're done you're thinking damn i that was a good workout i was sweating yeah and it's it's it keeps your mind same much yeah bring up jujitsu all the time but you're you're worried about getting choked and you're trying not to lose and you're trying to do all this stuff. By the time you're done, you're thinking, I didn't even think of that as exercise. Yeah. But people the, have the opposite problem too, where they exercise a lot, but then they go home and eat like crap and they don't see results either. Yeah. So. Right. That's true. What were you going to say? Well, I, I think the exercise issue, like sports is great. I think the biggest problem though, is you can't, you can't rely on another person for your exercise. Yeah. So like tennis or, you know, crazy ping pong or whatever. It's awesome if you have like somebody there that you could do that regularly, but but most people don't. You know, you got to that's why I mean, it's interesting. I see so many healthy people that are around me that just like they like I got to go get on the treadmill or yeah. I got to go run or I got to do this and they get addicted to it, but the runner's high, they got to chase yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, which I just can't relate to that cuz it's like for me, like work is my exercise because I'm working all the time, but it's not an exercise. It's like a mental exercise. So it makes me feel like I'm exhausted and I'm working hard, but I'm that there's nothing going on with my muscles <laughs> when that happens. That's I can the see problem. You mixing and like curling with the yeah. other arm, and <laughs> they do sell these things that you can kind of work your legs on as you're sitting. It's funny. It's yeah. like anything you could do to just move your body, but. Running isn't for everybody. I know when people are really out of shape, they start running and their knees are dead. Yeah. And you get to a certain point and even playing tennis could be really tough, just moving and not hurting yourself. But I don't know. There's always, uh, at least starting with diet and then you have that little bit of a jump start to when you do run or you do some other exercise, you don't feel like it's such an uphill climb. But no matter what, those first few weeks are going to be hell. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants yeah. to start that stuff. I know. I know. But I don't Anyways. know. 
got a got a lifetime to figure that out. <laughs> but I was also thinking about Corey and I didn't really even talk about the old band or anything. Maybe that's good. But it was interesting talking about him after the band and what he started doing. He played with Hook Echo and he gave us the whole story about how they almost I didn't realize they played CBGBs and they went oh, out. Yeah? They went awesome. out and did all these things for industry people, but they just didn't hit at the right time and all that. But I always thought it was funny how we ended up into the studio world after all that. Because yeah. when we first started in our metal band, we didn't know anything about recording. And the, our first experience recording was probably Bill Bailey, right? Yeah. Mirror Image. Mirror Image Studios. Yep. Going into his basement. I remember that. Yep. Setting up all our stuff and recording on, I think it was one inch tape. Yeah, it was one inch 16 track. Yep. That all seemed amazing. And uh, it was all a big mystery, but I don't know when you realized you liked all that stuff. Well, I mean, I think. That, you know, the story is for us is uh, I think we always used to go to studios after that. I mean, when we'd try different things and we'd hear the outcome and we wouldn't like it. <laughs> we'd compare it to Metallica's albums and go, our stuff doesn't sound like that. How do we get, you know, how do we get, how do I get my drums to sound like that? Remember Pantera was a big. Oh yeah. The clickiness. Test. Oh gosh. And going up to Gary's board. And turning up the bass knobs all the way because we thought that's what made a guitar yeah. heavy. Yeah. And he just kind of let us do it. Like, whoa, yeah. whoa, whoa. Yeah. You're right. It was dissatisfaction, I think. Yeah. Or, I mean, well, for one thing, we couldn't afford it. We couldn't <laughs> afford being at other studios. So <laughs> so we had to find some way to get our stuff to sound better. So we just tried things at, house, at our house, you know, at my parents' house. and But what started it? Did I buy the VS-880 or did you buy the no. the reel-to-reel and the board? I had, yeah. Well, beforehand, let's see. My memory is really cloudy, so that's why I Yeah, you. no, you didn't get the VS-880 until later, way later. With Mike Lott. Yeah, with okay. Mike Lott, yeah. So I started with the this Ramza. Was it a Ramza? That sounds familiar. It's just like just... Total crappy live board, like really bad live. Didn't board. have huge knobs, or was yeah. that the other board? Um, well, the knobs I remember would stick, like you try to turn them, and they wouldn't turn very well. It, it was no, it was it was it wasn't Ramza. It was a Crest. I, I think it was a Crest board. Really? Yeah, it was. It was just, and it was just cheap. But um, and we were recording to a. We started recording just to a cassette deck. We would we'd put things put things like different crappy mics up Jeez. and just record straight to a cassette just to start to learn. And I remember doing different things that way because I, for some reason in my brain, I was thinking that those um, like the Porta Studios is, was like my dream of getting the eight track version of the Porta Studio, which was a cassette deck, I and it that. would record on both sides at the same time. Because a lot of people had the four track, but the eight track was sought out. Yes, yes. And so I always looked at that, and I, I, I could swear that maybe you or Al or somebody had a four-track Porter Studio, but mm -hmm. I can't remember who it was. I had a 424. Yeah, okay. So maybe that's where that came, and I, I remember if we like panned it left and right, we could bounce things or whatever. But it wasn't mine, though. I never owned yeah, one. Yeah, I don't know where that came from. Matt had one. But then, then I remember <laughs> it was like um, Easter in... I really wanted to get a recorder and my parents bought me a half inch eight track reel to reel machine for Easter. I was wow, like, Easter like what Easter? That doesn't look like candy, but it, they knew I wanted it. And I think they just like had to find some way to justify it. And instead of just buying me something, they're like, okay, Easter is here. Just so your here sister you wouldn't go. get jealous. Yeah. <laughs> Here's some <laughs> exactly. ear candy for, for Easter. Yeah. So, yeah. So then we, once we got that, that was like a, I didn't understand anything about recording. Did it come with it, tape? It must have came with one reel. <laughs> it, I don't know. I I know I I did find tape. I I, I can't remember how that all worked out. I was going to say, where the hell did we get tape? Yeah. Well, I remember just kind of well. Guitar Center probably carried. You know, it back early then. at that time when we were getting into it, we were recording in other studios. So we, I would just ask questions to all the guys we were, you know, working with. And Gary DeHaven ended up kind of being my mentor in that kind of world. So I would guess that he was telling me, walking me through some of the stuff after I had bought it. But I had no idea that eight tracks for half-inch tape actually was really 
good quality because really most of the machines that were out there were eight tracks but quarter inch tape yeah you know so because so two inch I, was 24 usually right yeah two inch okay. 24 one inch 16 okay is the same same as half inch eight track right so the same kind of quality versus the the quarter inch decks although there's, there were some decent quarter inch decks out there but i had no idea that i was buying a better sounding machine than most yeah. situations and it just i don't know how i even found it like city pages or something that way that's what i was going to ask you did your parents just give you money to get it or my dad took me because it's not okay yeah no my dad would just, he would always support us remember back in the <sighs> band days yeah. where we would need a pa and he'd go take us to like some place like b sharp or some <laughs> some place and just the guy said they have a great pa there we just have to show yeah. up and, and unfortunately we bought junk at those times but actually that's how that worked out now that we talk about it that pa that that my dad bought us this heavy gray serwin vega speakers with no we had to buy a power amp to do it but that board it that, that came with amp? it no. Oh, yeah. That was the power it's amp. sitting right that there. That is funny. <laughs> That's the crest. Okay. Still working. And you know what? I think the board, by the way, Tony has the that board somewhere. Really? Not yeah. Brett? Oh, no. I think it's Tony. Brett has your speakers, I think. And your huge old board, I believe. Didn't you Brett, trade him for Brett, something? Brett, oh, yeah. He has the JBL speakers and the old board. Yeah. He's still using that stuff. Yeah. That is so funny. <laughs> uh, but So that's how it worked out. So we had this PA and, and then... I utilized that that crappy crappy board to start recording with. That it was that, more of a live board, really. It, right? it was, yeah. Okay. There was no, there wasn't a monitor path and a channel path, like two separate. It was just a way to get to the recorder, and there wasn't even any buses on there, so it was oh you could only record two things at once. But uh, yeah, so that, that's funny how that all kind of comes back. That's what Corey and I realized. If you go back and you start being sequential about everything, new ideas pop into your head. That's how we got that. Yeah, yeah. But we needed those speakers to play an outdoor talent show. Yep. Or uh, whatever that was. It was at a, it was at a fair. Ramsey County yeah, Fair. Yeah, Ramsey County Fair. <laughs> I still have video of that. That's where we played in that half trailer, and I jumped off your riser and hit my head on the top oh, of, the, no. of the ceiling. Oh, but didn't oh. we? No, there was no winners or anything. I don't think that was a competition. Okay. No. Because no. we did do those, too. We, yeah. Yeah. So but after you, I monopolized it at night because you'd go to bed, and I learned somehow you taught me how to use the reel-to-reels. Yeah. Yeah. And just making my depressing songs and <laughs> learning about it. But it was really helpful just to learn how signal was flowing to it and mixing a little bit. But you were doing full bands, I think, through that, weren't yeah, you? Yeah. Yeah. Well, eventually, so eventually when I we started to record more of the studios, and I started to realize that. I could actually get some decent tones, but just needed to get some better equipment. So, um, and then that's when Gary actually had Gary DeHaven had uh, the board that that Tascam board, the really? big board. Really? Yep. So he had the Tascam board sitting in his basement. Plus, he had these uh, TT patch bays and everything. So I bought that through him, and then kind of I don't think he knew. Um, that he was going to help me as much as he did, but yeah. but, uh, but I mean, because I had no idea what a patch bay was, so I bought this stuff, and then it's crazy how it worked out because he gave me all the parts. So there was no, there was some cabling, but like the, the, not the right ends, and so I had to learn how to solder. It was a mess. I remember. Yeah, yeah. So I had no idea how to solder, and so you or, learned what a patch bay was. It was a headache. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> at least at first. And it was stupid. It was TT on the front end, which was super <laughs> tiny telephone, which is like the pros kind of concept, which was awesome. But the back was RCA. Really? So it was I didn't stupid. Know that. It was like, so every connection that I made, I had to put, bring down to an RCA connection. But it didn't match the that stupid Tascam board that I had that had RCAs. On so the you had to have all well. adapters or something. Yeah. Or oh, that right. it was a Tascam M16 is what it was. I don't remember that as well as your 32 by eight bus. Yeah. So the had. Tascam was the big one that looked that was twice the size of my Mackie board, and it had the um, the ar the puffy armrest on it. Yeah, okay. And it had like the the brown and orange knobs on it. All there, I like, remember is that color. It looked like a 70s console. Yeah. Or totally. Something. 
Totally. I mean, it was in, there was like little, but it was like a real board. That was what was cool. It, it was not good quality. Had the VU meters and everything. But, it, but it, it actually had a channel path and a monitor path. It, it allowed me to learn the process of recording, which was, I had no idea, but I could have went a different route. If I would have got that Porta Studio with the eight track and like the mixer built in, I, I don't think I would be where I am now. Like it's it so been crazy. Too easy. It would have. I probably would have lost interest, and it wouldn't have taught. It wouldn't have allowed me to like learn what the big studios do. Because I mean, you know, it's like in a big studio, it's like we have all the different gear and all that stuff for show. It's awesome, but the concepts are all the same. I mean, if you have if you have the ability to just get your signal to your recorder and then have it come back and hear it through your speakers, it it doesn't matter if you're on a Mackie or an SSL. It's the same concept, you know. One looks cooler, yeah. You know, <laughs> for but sure. But signal flow is a lot still more expensive. Yeah, but signal okay. flow is the same. But but yet, if I had a Porter Studio, it would all happen like internally, you know. And so I don't know if I would have, if I, I don't know if my brain would have been able to figure out once it was split out later, you know. Kind of maybe not to get too out there, but kind of maybe similar for people that are learning just with the computer these days. You I know? was going to say, I was sort of that person. Remember I was getting into VS 880 world. Luckily I knew you because I think you recall you were asking me the most basic questions and I didn't know. Yeah. Oxen return. Right. And I was thinking, I don't know. The VS 880 just does it for me. Mm-hmm. I pushed this. <laughs> it's kind of like you ever watch breaking bad. Yeah. Where Jesse wanted, he had to go to Mexico and make the stuff finally for the first time himself. And he's, I was him basically. And he was saying, well, I don't know how to make this chemical. It's always in the barrel with a bumblebee on it or whatever. That was me. It's just where this button is. I don't know where it's sending it to or if there's a cable that's supposed to go from here to there. I don't know how to move that signal back or anything. Yeah. It, yeah. It's interesting. You know, now there's the other side of that. It's like you don't have to know all that stuff because <laughs> even – beforehand like when you would do stuff like your stuff would sound good because you would you would just tinker with it for until it sounded the way you thought it should and then you didn't have to go write a report about how it worked or anything after that or anything yeah and it's that's always an interesting thing i see that a lot um where clients will bring me stuff that they they have no idea how to record and i'll pull it up i'll be like dang this sounds pretty dang good you did this in your basement or in your house and they just did it you know and i'll look and i'll see things are not textbook right like yeah. you know like visually but at some point you got to be like who gives a crap you know how it's um how it's laid out if it sounds the way it should sound then who can say that's wrong you know it's, now that's true if you a lot of times though i find out that they spent you know <laughs> maybe like a week straight on this one song to try to get it there then we can go well you know i could show you a way to get there faster and more efficiently that know? seems to be the way of the self i was gonna do a video on that soon the self-learning like i was a self-learning guitarist for a lot of years and a lot of the stuff that took me six months, a teacher could have showed me in two weeks. But I seem to have cemented it in my brain better because I was so hungry for the answer that I seeked it out and I had to figure it out the hard way. And then you are a better teacher, I think, afterwards because you learn it the hard way and you can actually show them the quicker way after that. Sure. You know, all the pitfalls. Yeah. I had a student the other day taking piano lessons with me and she, every time I teach her, she, okay, yeah, yeah. And then she goes home and comes back because it's just a little bit better the next week. Well, she came in and she actually wanted to learn a song, a specific one. And as I was teaching her, she was saying, well, what's this symbol? She was looking at the sheet music. And for once, she was asking me questions. So when I said, oh, that's actually a natural symbol, she thought it was a sharp symbol. She locked that in her brain because she was, it was like a, she finally cultivated the garden to want to grow. She actually wanted to, she was curious about a question. So if I tell you a bunch of jujitsu moves, you're not going to care. You're going to walk up and leave and forget it. But if you get in a fight and you got choked, how could I have gotten out of that chokehold, Mike? Well, if you just want to put your hand here, you're going to remember that. Oh, yeah. So it's a weird thing. I want to do a whole video on that. How do you cultivate curiosity in people? And can you even do it? Or do you have to wait for someone to actually be in a position where they're asking you questions? Well, I, oh, boy, I could talk a lot about that because that's something that has been a teacher for many years. Yes. Like, I think so much about that. And I think, you know, human nature 
wants to just watch somebody teaching them and then memorize the whole process, you know? So, um, you know, if, if you're going to fix my car and you're a mechanic and it's like, and then I should be able to fix that. I'm going to just watch you. And then, and then that when it's my turn to fix my car, I'm going to try to do every step exactly the same. And the problem with that is that only works if it's in the exact same scenario or the exact same problem. So that's not, in my book, that's not actually learning, that's memorizing. And I, I, I always put those in two separate categories, memorization and learning. Mm -hmm. No, because if you can, learning is understanding what each process is for. Like, so knowing when you turn a bolt to fix the car, like, what is that doing? Is that loosening something? And if it's loosening something, why is it loosening? It's loosening to get the belt off, you know? Well, what's that belt for there for, you know? So that kind of process is, that's learning because you actually are able to then go look at a different engine and go, oh, okay, I can see there's some sort of belt here that's yeah. connected. And I know that that turns the blower, you know. That's like, more universal learning. And you learn quick. I remember learning about changing oil. I actually did learn a few things about, my dad's a huge car guy and I yeah. never got into it. But the second you turn that screw and oil spills all over your face, you know, you learn quick. Versus watching it on a YouTube video and saying, watch out for this bolt. Yeah. If you actually get your hands dirty, it seems to be a whole different level. Yeah, totally. You know, I mean, and there's, don't get me wrong, there's certain situations where, you know, like programming your remote control or something. Yeah. You got a universal remote control. It's like, well, I don't need to know how this remote was made and why each thing is there. It's like, just show me the damn tutorial of how to That's interesting you say that because my... both times you mentioned that same thing, it's because technology was at a higher level and you didn't need to get dirty necessarily. So whether you're talking about working a plug-in and just using a preset, let's say, and not really learning how they dialed it in versus the old way where you had to buy this actual hard piece of gear and, and turn the knobs the right way. So do sure. you think technology is making us not need all that depth? Oh, yeah. Ooh. I think that's in a perfect world. Techno well, I think that's what a lot of things, I, I think anyways, technology is created to make life easier for people, right? So um, – so there's a lot of things that are automated or just you don't have to learn how to do it. Just just press a button and it does it, mm -hmm. you know. Um, Drag a loop into GarageBand and you get your drummer. Yeah, exactly. I mean, like when it comes to digital audio workstations these days, that they're trying to find different avenues. I mean, like, for example, there's a um, – I forgot. I think it's Native Instruments or it's maybe another company, but they, they have this like – this plugin that that's like a bass player plugin and a guitar player plugin. Finally. Yeah. And it's, and it's like, literally it just like, you have to, you don't have to know anything about the instrument, you know, and you just, it, and it's amazing actually how it works and how it sounds. It sounds like a black mirror it, episode. Yeah. It's, you don't need a it, band. You yeah. Just, <laughs> yeah. It's you super crazy. I mean, like logic with its, um, it's drummer, track that you can pull up it is unbelievable what you can do you don't have to know anything about drumming you just you can literally pull up a group any group actually you pick um there's a list of drummers that it has oh that's and, and they they name them like create like whatever freaky nicky or i don't know <laughs> it's like i want I freaky nicky no for I, sure. i've just made that up but um but anyways they have these like a drummer and they have like a certain look, a picture of them. And like, they're like the West coast punk rock drummer. And then there's the, oh. like this guy. And so they, they have a, a description of each drummer. And so you can then pick them. And then when you pick them, they're going to have already a certain type of drum sound attached to it. Okay. So it'll be like, you know, if it's whatever, a punk rock kind of thing, it'll be more of a roomy, big drum tone kind of thing. And then if you do something like a Latin drummer or something, it might be real dry and close sounding. And, yeah. And so that has nothing to do with even the groove you're picking because that you just picking like the character, the guy who's sitting at the drums or girl and the drums. Freaky Nikki. Well, yeah, exactly. And, and how they, they hit do it and everything. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. So you like load that, that, 
whatever that would be, that description of that person, right? You're loading and, a personality. Almost. Yeah, you're loading a personality. Whoa. And then then you pick the groove that you want them to play. And then you can go in and then pull that up. And then there's a like a, a rectangle box. And you can choose if you want them to be the, if you go one like left and right on the on the grid, you're choosing how hard and how soft they are. And then if you go up and down, you're choosing how um, how like if you go higher, you're do, you're choosing to do more riffs or more like extra things. More Travis like, Barker. Yeah, and then lower, on. they're you're, they're doing more straight. And then you can actually go diagonally to like change and get like go more aggressive and in more like so harder. And more intricate drum thing. It's it's amazing, and you can do that per in, per limb too. So you could say, <laughs> I want the the snare drum to be you know more busy. So then they'll go to like um you know lots of of shadow snare drum okay. hits and things like that. You know, but you can beats. make them heavy footed or yeah, and, or you can just and so you and, and then on top of that, you can then just you've got like a way to groove things, and it's just amazing where you can <laughs> you I could do all. I figured out the humanize option on Pro Tools yeah. yet, and we're doing <laughs> so in the future. You could do Lars Ulrich's kick drum foot, <laughs> yeah, Neil Pert's or Pert's uh, yeah hand left hand. That's crazy. Well, and that's what's cool. It's like once you kind of dial in something, then what you could do is you can tell it to um, save your groove the way it is, but then maybe um, you can do vice versa, but you could then change personalities. So you could get the groove dialed in, but then you could say, no, now I want this other person to play the groove, and then you click on it, but everything else will stay the same. Or you can do... The opposite, where the person stays, the drum kit stays, but then you can choose the the grooves from the other people Either and are. have them play that groove, but with the the drum sound. And they haven't gotten into yeah. artists yet; they just do generic things right now. Yeah, it's like their own. I think it, a lot of it's probably copyright stuff and things that. But way. But in the like, future, yeah, cheaper just to go without the real yeah. artist. But imagine in the future, I want Travis Barker to play on this track. Do you think he would go in the studio and actually? put himself in an AI situation where he's not needed anymore like that. I guess if he's getting older and he doesn't want to do as many things, but wouldn't that be shooting yourself in the foot? Good question. Depends how much they pay you, I guess. Yeah. Right. Each performance, they have to pay your royalties <laughs> or something. That's, in- I didn't know about yeah, that. Yeah. So what about the bass player and guitar player? Cause guitar is really hard to emulate unless you have definite loops or yeah. chunks of things. Yeah. I, 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 ha- I don't have an extensive, um, you know, knowledge of those programs i've just pulled them up and go what is this and who it's makes like, it oh my gosh you know i'm for some reason i'm thinking that it's native instruments and but i can't remember if it's actually them or not okay i'd have to look it up but. it sounds a lot like guitar hero sort of where you see the band playing and you know they're a punk band because of the way they look all of a sudden you can make them cr- create music with you yeah wow yeah it, it's it's pretty it's pretty cool I, i'm actually like i mean Part of me battles even just with technology in <clears throat> like, you know, somebody being able to go to go to their bedroom and make something sound really good. Like part of me goes, Oh, that's just awesome and unbelievable because I would I wanted we wanted to be that mm-hmm. way and be able to do some of that stuff. But then the other part of that goes, damn, that sucks. Like I, I've put so much time and money into my craft and you know, and being able to do something and then some kid comes in with this this thing that just that sounds louder than I made it. <laughs> it sounds <laughs> it sounds like killer, you know, really good. And and so there's this kind of battle with like you go, wait a second, I, I think that's really cool, but is this gonna make me obsolete? You know, <laughs> it's like I think we all you have know, to face get, that. Yeah. yeah, you know, but you know, that's just like self confidence and in that's just stuff that everybody deals with that. And, and frankly, that that makes me work harder and just go, uh, instead of running from it, just go running to it and going, you know what? Even though that does sound good, um, I still feel like there's things I have to offer, you know, this person even that brings things in. And there's, then you really look at it and you go, you know what? There is actually a reason why they are bringing it to me. And usually there's just a couple of small things we can kind of work on and in, in fix it, and then it brings it into a whole nother world, you know, after my first, like, holy crap. Yeah, you listen. have to get over the shock of it. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty yeah. good. Do you really need me? But yeah. there are. Yeah, there's times where I wonder <laughs> that, too. 
<laughs> you're paying him to show you how he did that. What? Yeah. <laughs> but what's crazy is there's still going to be the, the top people. And I think what all this technology does to all of us is it makes us work harder to be at the elite level so that people who still want that stuff at the highest level will come to that instead of just looping a guitar, uh, a garage band track and just, I don't know, it just seems kind of like you have to dedicate yourself 100% just to last a little bit longer. Because eventually I think we're all going to be replaceable. The AI guitar teacher that no matter what question yeah. you have, they're sitting right there in your bedroom as a hologram. and Oh, yeah. It's crazy. I was just looking at my, just to see if it yeah. came up quick. but Sounds like something Native Instruments would do. Play with Dave Weckl. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be actually a cool way to learn, too, to see if you could copy his grooves and all that. I always use Dave Weckl as the example of the ultimate clean, like perfect drummer. Remember yeah. watching his old instructional videos? Oh, and, yeah. Oh, God. So I don't feel bad too bad when I think of my age and how much I've done in life with music to think it could change over at any time, the old cocoon turning into the butterfly. Yeah. If the butterfly is whatever's coming out next... I had a good run and maybe in my next life I'll be in the next part of it or whatever. But I always wonder if we, I don't know, it's, it's almost futile. It's like resistance is futile. It's interesting. Why fight it? You know, you see somebody that like we, when us growing up, we would see somebody who we idolized and then our goal is to like do what they could do and then ultimately try to do better than what they yeah. would do. So you wonder like, you know, if somebody, if there is, if we're, somebody takes us over and replaces us though, like there's still got to be some mechanism of somebody seeing that and then building upon that, you know, like, what is it? I mean, humans, I mean, there's, that's not to get too deep on that, but it's like, go deep, Chris, go, yeah. <laughs> go deep. <laughs> but at the same time, it's like humans, there's, there's a quality to humans, like for us to, like, it's one thing to demonstrate how to play something perfectly, but then how do you demonstrate how to play it perfectly with emotion? Yeah, or, imperfections or, usually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. imperfections, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, and that's... You program the robot to have imperfections. <laughs> some of our greatest music that we, you know, listen to and love, what what do we love about it? We love the imperfections in a lot of cases. Yeah, you know? we, go, we went through that phase where Dream Theater and Rush and everything was... So, they're still awesome. But then you go back to the gritty 60s and 70s and you wonder why you love some of those tones. It's because they're peaking a little bit or the guy's not the best guitar player, but he puts emotion. That's what like Neil Young is to me. But you ever see that Twilight Zone episode where the guy gets replaced by a robot? The boss comes in and says, I'm going to revolutionize everything in this company. And everybody gets replaced by technology. No. And the guy gets so pissed off. He's at the bar drinking and he's like, we can't. You can't replace flesh and bone. And he freaks out and he grabs a huge pipe and starts beating up the robot. And it's so, that was oh. way back in the 50s. And it's happening now. We're seeing so many things being replaced by technology. And you just wonder, when's my time? It's very selfish right. to think that, but it's true. People who drive semi trucks are being going to be replaced by self driving. Uh, taxis are being yeah. replaced by Uber and all that. And some of that stuff. I think is super awesome mm -hmm. because I mean, think about that. If they can make it so we have less accidents and people getting killed by that, you know, I mean, I'm sure there's going to be stuff that like that, but so, I mean, oh boy, I, I was just listening to someone on the radio and they were talking about similar, just like that. So it's like, instead of worrying about, <laughs> about like us being replaced, what we might need to worry more about is what else could we do instead? You know, like if we're going to lose all, you know, taxi drivers because of, of, you know, self-driving cars or whatever, then yeah. what else can they do? Let's create other jobs or other things that they could do. Did so, you hear the controversy about that? No. These people, I don't know where it was. I think it was probably Reddit. Everything seems to be started <laughs> on Reddit. They created this campaign called Learn to Code. So they said, screw those people who can't drive cabs they can just learn to code, kind of like teach them how to just be computer programmers overnight. Oh. And it became this sort of derogatory thing to the point where I think Twitter was banning people for using that phrase, learn to code. You're kidding. Isn't that weird? Oh my but gosh. I like the concept of it, not 
that drastic. I'm not going to take a 70 year old guy who's just been a plumber his whole life and suddenly teach him how to be the world's best programmer. Yeah. But I think we're lucky because we're in more of a creative field. And the one thing it seems that computers have the hardest time doing is doing the creative stuff. They could do technical things pretty well. Although I'm learning that they're beating people in these weird games that I've never heard of before. Obviously chess, but a game called Go. And they're creating moves that they've never seen before. So in a way that's creative in a tac- like tactical way. Yeah. But I wonder, I heard a song written by computers. Did you hear that? Uh, yeah, I was going to bring that up, yeah, actually. It's yeah. called Daddy's Car. It's, yeah. It's all AI Total written. Total pop song. Yeah. It sounds like a Beatles song. And what's funny is I thought it was robots playing it, too, but I think it's humans playing it, but they the robots wrote it. Yeah. And it's creepy, and it sounds like an Asian-type thing. And I thought, if I heard this, I would think just a bunch of hipsters got together and wrote it. And I remember <laughs> I did a gig with the Honey Dogs, and we were sitting backstage, and one of the members played the song, and we all sat in the room, and it was like we were wa- we were listening to our impending doom. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> this is the thing that will replace us. <laughs> but my question is, you brought up people are coming in with these loops and sounding good and everything. But I also realize people are lowering their expectations, which scares me because that's yeah. what makes this stuff acceptable. So if somebody can't sing and their entire song is all auto-tuned, but that's the new sound and people accept it, there's nothing to compl- – you can't fight against it because people want to hear that now. So it's like we lowered people's expectations while making the recording process easier and it met in this middle area where there's nothing you can do. Yeah. That scares me that we would lower expectations. It is but. tricky. I, I've recorded multiple people where like they'll bring in – they'll have me mix something and I'll like shut off the autotune that they recorded with and it's nowhere near something – Passable. Do you, you know? blackmail them? Yeah. If you don't pay no. me, I'll release this. <laughs> People have well, done that. You know, I mean, for me, I'm work for hire, you know, I'm freelance. So it's like I have to try to polish whatever they bring me, you know? Yeah. There is always that. And when you're that in that scenario, you always have that like moral concepts of like, you know, do okay, how do I feel about this? <laughs> you know. But I mean, for me, it is what it is. I mean, you know, you just, you, anything that I try to go whatever direction that they want to go in. I mean, it's, they're paying me and, yeah. and it'd be different if they're hiring me to be a producer, you know, in producer music, that'd be a whole different That's story. True. Cause then, then I wouldn't feel right because uh, you know, maybe I have a, th- if I, we would have to match up and make sure that we have the same type of goals musically to move forward and if somebody can't sing and they're hiring me to make them a great singer um then we it probably just i, I don't think i could morally deal with that you know gotta but, sleep still sleep at night yeah exactly i mean because then all you're doing is taking their money you know um but it, but if it's a situation where i'm just trying to make something sound better a lot of times i can disconnect myself from that from the music quality of it or or sometimes lyrical content too you know like there's Mm -hmm. situations where sometimes what something is somebody's trying to convey and say i might not agree with you know um but i wouldn't necessarily walk away from it um when you say that do you mean it's just cheesy or it's not well, musical. It could be cheesy, could be offensive. You oh, know? Um, really? Could, yeah. You know, I mean, there are certain scenarios sometimes. I mean, you know, if you're whatever, that maybe somebody's saying something that you don't agree with, you know. Like you're um, recording two live crew or something. Yeah, right. Or, okay. <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe, you know, there's been different. I've had some situations where I've recorded some people that maybe have are trying to say a message to like another group of like a gang or oh. some sort of things that way and you're like geez i you know i i'm neutral here right? you know you're like don't even put yeah. my name in the credits yeah 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 and it's like you know i've been fortunate where it usually it doesn't go too far you know if it did I, I you know i guess i would start to go in my head going like how far do i let this go before i have to say something about it but That'd be a good Black Mirror uh, episode. Yeah. Like a sound engineer who's forced to record some radical groups yeah. <laughs> like message or something. Yeah. That's crazy. I, I think where I would draw the line, though, is if I if somebody was saying something, that they were going to do something, and they went and did it, I, I'd i have a big problem with that. You know, If yeah. somebody's just messing around like Eminem, like think about all the crazy things Eminem said. He didn't go out and 
you know, kill his girlfriend and put her in the trunk and do all this stuff. But yet he was saying he was going to do this and it was all for the art. And you're right. Going that's that, the, you that's the dividing line. Yeah. You're yeah. right though. As soon as some, there have been people in the past that you've worked with that actually went out and did some crazy stuff, right? Yeah. But they disappeared. So you yeah. didn't have to deal with it right. afterwards. Yeah. It's good. Right. It's people crazy. don't know that you worked with a lot of rap for a while. It was a big thing. Yep. And you were even flying out to Atlanta. Yep. For a Those were years weird, working, crazy days. Yeah. I remember eating at Market Barbecue. Remember that place? <laughs> yeah. And you were telling me all these stories and about these guys are wearing twenty thousand dollar watches and stuff. Oh yeah. And you got sucked into that a little bit. Now you're wearing an Apple iWatch. Yeah. Right? Call <laughs> Yours. <it. laughs> yeah. <actually. laughs> I told John that story. I said he was talking about retiring at age thirty three, and how he realized buying a super expensive sound system in his living room just. It was one step too far for him, even though he admitted that he, it was the first time he listened to Dream Theater and showed Tony and they were both blown away. Yeah. I was thinking maybe it wasn't that bad of a, a thing, but for me, it was when I bought that watch only because it's awesome and I love running and having earbuds and not needing my phone when I run, but it just kept buzzing on me and I just didn't like the feeling <laughs> of it. And it, I felt like I bought one extra thing too much. I was like, anything yeah. below that, I'm cool. I just, for some reason, I'm not a watch yeah. guy. You know what I you know what I love and hate about it at the same time is every time I look at it when I get a text yeah. and I re I read it yeah clients or people that I'm around think I'm looking at the clock in in thinking that I almost that said we should something. like like I'm <laughs> wrap it up yeah exactly like oh do you need to go somewhere it's like oh no no like that's happened to me. 10 times since I've got this watch and that that's always a problem for me. Cause I like just took any job interviews with it. Yeah. Well, I worry about like, I always worry about like people wanting to be comfortable in a session around me. And if they think I'm looking at my watch because I want to end the session, that's not a good feeling. So it's sort of like jiggling your keys. Yeah. People are, you got somewhere to go, buddy. Yeah. But the thing of it is, is if I had my phone in front of me mm -hmm. and I was looking at a text, they wouldn't think the same True. thing. True. Especially if you just clicked it, looked at it and put it down. Real right. Quick. But at the same, t but the watch is actually l like less intrusive, but yet. It's seared people, in our brain. People that. think that I'm looking at the time going, how to get the hell out of here, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the case at all. You got to do what old guys do now that we're old guys and put the, you ever see people that oh, put the yeah. face on the wrist? <laughs> My grandpa's do that. He'd yeah. be like, mm, yeah. what are you doing? <laughs> that's probably something a generation did for a while. Well, it's probably, it's probably more likely where those older watches are harder to size and they would just get Maybe. looser and stuff. They just on the bottom like this. <laughs> yeah. But it okay. makes more sense to do this. This isn't a natural bringing your elbow up to look that way. It doesn't make sense. It's yeah. really weird. We keep bumping you, the mic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> These are actually pretty... You do hear when someone hits that, yeah. but it's surprising how much these microphones deaden everything you don't want. Nice. I guess that's why everybody uses them for podcasts. Yeah. This or what is it? The RE20. Mm -hmm. I'm going to use that. We're going to have a full band heartless podcast, which I'm a little worried about. Oh yeah. Cause that's five microphones oh. and we're going to do good. it out there, I think. But we have these two, we have the RE20 and then probably 258s. Cause I don't yeah. have any other microphones that'll do it. Don't you have the, um, 103s? Would I want to use those though? Wouldn't that pick up a bunch of? They're cardioid. They're pretty okay. fairly directional. If you, I thought maybe a fifty-eight, close. even though it wouldn't sound as good, would be more. Yeah, you could experiment. Yeah, I'll do a test beforehand. But that's we're going to sit in a circle. It's going to be super weird. Howard Stern uses a U eighty-seven. As oh, his mic. you're right. Yeah, and he always pulls it just, down. Yeah, he pulls it down, yeah. but he's <laughs> he's listening really close, and he's isn't just he in a different room than everyone though? Mm. He's got that booming radio voice, so I think he needs the whole room to himself. You know, I guess I, it's been so long since I've seen that. I thought they were in a similar room, but. I just copy Joe Rogan. He uses oh. these, but he has those really cool desk arms. Yeah. And I looked those up. They're pretty expensive, but I want to get some, but yeah. I just don't have a desk. Oh, I'm sure there's cheaper versions of them out there. What What else can they connect to? A mic stand, you think? Yeah, or well, you can take a boom and connect it to it. That'd be cool. Yeah. At least it would be movable and it would go up and over so people can move it wherever they want it. Yeah. This one is pretty much right in front of your face or nothing, which I guess is good. But yeah. the problem are these spinny chairs. I keep moving. You're, you're good at it. You're, you're like this, but some people will go like this yeah. and their mouth is way over here. <laughs> but I looked up, this is so cheesy, pretty much podcast for dummies. And they mentioned these mics, but they also mentioned 
these Zoom Recorders? deals as a backup. Oh, nice. So I'm feeding it from something to that just in case Pro Tools decides to freeze. I'll still have a backup of it. That's cool. Yeah. So it works out. Redundancy is good. Yeah. In the I, digital world. Well, the first time I did it, the first podcast, I accidentally had, because I have it still running through all the weird stuff in the computer, and I had Pro Tools unmuted, so it was a chorusy sound. You could hear two voices every time oh. someone talks. So that's how you, I learned so much from the first podcast, mostly that I say like every five seconds. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get over that. Where, as far as now... We didn't really even touch too much on stuff. This is what's great about my closest friends is we we could talk for two hours and still barely touch on yeah. everything. <laughs> yeah. Corey and I went all the way back to talking about that gig we did where, <laughs> where I forgot where it was, but there were garbage bags on the ceiling and it was yeah. raining and it was starting yeah. to rain on that you. That was like in Iowa or something. I want to see if you remember the band we Fall played with. Oh my God. You got it right away. <laughs> I was Googling. Do you remember their big song they had on Loud and Local? Don't was, remember that. No. Okay. Do you remember the singer had sort of frizzy yeah. Oh, yeah. metal hair? Well, they had a song called Murderapolis. Oh, really? Yeah. And it was kind of a big hit on Loud and Local. And he kept saying, look that up. And I couldn't find the band's name until I went home. And then when you when I heard False Oath, it all you know fell into place. I remember that song, Murder Apples. Yeah. Yeah. It was kind of... I guess I didn't realize they did that song. But. Yep. It was them. And I guess Corey's band had a song that was on Loud and Local. It hit number one, like, I think three times. And that's when they got some attention from a manager. Oh, cool. And he took them on that whole run. I guess yeah. it was in two, the early 2000s when they went out to New York and played all that stuff. Mm -hmm. But I always laugh at the idea of all of us have that story of almost making it. Yeah. Well, and it's all in the eyes of what's almost making it. You yeah. Know? Like I see, um, you know, I mean, back when we were young and dumb and, you know, we, we thought there were certain levels, but now dealing with, with people, it's like, you know what? We were actually a long ways from yeah. making it. I mean, it, and what is making it, you know, but it's, it's interesting. Cause I, I see, I'll now, now work with like people that are on a label and they're touring and in our eyes, we think that's making it and they're not, you know, they have not made it. <laughs> I mean, they're, they could be dropped any day from their label and, yeah. or it'd like do a record and it just gets shelved and they're done. You that's know? exactly what Corey said. Yeah. He said the guy who's given him all this information, insider information about the industry, not really insider information, but just tips. If you get signed to a label, it's not winning the lottery. It's buying a ticket is what he said. And you have to still win. Yeah. So you might do an album and even get radio play like Quiet Drive did. They got all that yeah. play for time after time. And then the next album they wanted to do, Sony just, I think, sat on it and didn't release it. Yeah. Why would you – I don't know why you would do that to a band that looks – has so much potential. Right. So you're on this tour. You're waking up in a crappy tour bus or a van and you, you – people all say, oh, you made it big. You're on tour. But really, you know in the back of your head it's just playing the game still. Yeah. It's interesting. You you hear lots of stories about people that thought they were in the band that was going to make it and then all of a sudden that band would get shelved and then they'd go to another band and that's the band that takes off, you know, or just – the next yeah. one over. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Imagine if you were stubborn and never left that band, and right. then this band just took off without you. Mm -hmm. Even people that make it, though, I've got friends who do big tours, and they get paid as much as you would if you were local and yeah. played a gig, except you have to go on this grueling tour and wake up next to all... I, don't know. I always say yeah. I woke up next to Corey's ass one time in a van, <laughs> and I just thought, is this better than just being at home and practicing guitar because i sure had fun doing that yeah but that discounts all the fun we had playing shows and all the experiences oh, yeah. which a lot of people don't get to feel yeah i mean just i mean you know when we played first avenue main room for the first time that was like in our eyes we made it we made it <laughs> you know i mean and then you look back now and you're like well it's just a room you know but there's different levels of it totally you know i, I tell mean, people that story of the monitor situation. Oh yeah. How that panicked look in your eye oh. that you're going to have to play a whole show, not hearing anything. Yeah. yeah. What, what changed that? You just asked the guy for sound. Well, finally. yeah. I mean, we did sound check, right? So we did sound check and then, and 
and we started the song. And then after I, we started the song, I counted off. I heard nothing after that. It was like I <laughs> couldn't follow anything. And then I, I like – had to do some sort of hit and and looked at you and you gave me this like look like uh uh-uh, uh that was that was <laughs> off and, and I'm like oh my gosh and then we started going and, and it was like I'm all by myself back here and it was oh I thought literally that's the way it was gonna be Whoa. and so then we s- stopped because I was way off I think and then I looked at the monitor guy and I'm just like I can't hear anything he's like oh, I didn't turn your drum monitor on. And so he just like hits a button and it was just like, like back when I had hair, it like blew my hair back dang near. It was like, <laughs> and then after that, he's like, do you want kick drum in the monitor? Do you want toms? So I had like all my drums in there. And it was like the the first time I actually ever had like a real drum monitor after that. The so monitors was, that first have are so powerful too. Oh yeah. I mean, in back then it was like, that was a real deal setup. We we just weren't used to playing at like a real situation where the the drum monitor was like a small PA. I mean, there was a yeah. subwoofer on the drum monitor, <laughs> you know, in mid range and high end. So it was like it was just a full range setup just for me. You, you know? went from famine to feast in yeah. two seconds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank goodness for that because I was already nervous as could be just to be playing in Main that stage. venue. Yeah, and then to think what this is how the pros do it they do it they play without it hearing anything <laughs> and that wasn't the case thank goodness but yeah that was i always i'll remember that forever me too i think i remember <laughs> your relief look your relieved look and your panicked look just back to back yeah and how quickly that could happen but we went from i'm going to do a video on this soon we went from playing your basement parties and talent shows and very small gigs to 7th Street Entry and then eventually Main Stage, those were all metal massacres with a bunch of bands, but still, he still played the big stage. Yeah. In a really short amount of time, and I always equate that to the summer where we actually got together almost every day and practiced. Do you remember that summer? Oh, yeah. I distinctly remember Countdown to Extinction was sort of a soundtrack to that time. Yeah. So whatever year that was, do you remember what year that was? No. I don't. I remember Strength Beyond Strength Pantera. That too. Yes. That, yeah. <laughs> the Attack of the Killer. You had all those CDs. You yeah. had your selection, your library, and you had Prong back before oh, they gosh, were. Yeah. yeah. And you had Attack snap of the Killer Bees. Snap your fingers, Bees. snap your neck. You actually had Prove You Wrong, I think, was oh, the yeah. album. But that was a big one yeah. in life. <laughs> Absolutely. Which is funny. We got to see him recently, I think a few times, right? At the Caboose, was yeah. it? We saw, yeah. And at First F, yeah. we saw them. Oh, yeah. But I keep wondering, how much ass did we kick that summer to go from Lisa's party? That must have been longer than that. But I keep thinking that was a magical summer. And te- remember Testament, Souls of Black? Oh, yeah. That Absolutely. was a big one at the time. Yep. But I remember thinking, I think some of us had jobs. Corey probably did. He always worked KFC or something. Mm-hmm. But we still got together almost every day yep. and practiced. We just made it right after school. Just like a job. I was thinking the summer, though. Oh. That summer, and eventually you took us on your boat and stuff, but most of the time we worked pretty hard. Yeah, I think I'm two different times. I think I'm thinking of the time when we would go over to Al's and practice in his basement. Those were kind of darker days. Yeah, that's You're, the strength beyond strength days. Yeah, where just, those were later. Where they would, Corey and Al would go upstairs or something, and then we would just, like, force ourselves <laughs> to just learn that song. And, I'm proud of us for doing that. Yeah. Because it was one of those accomplishments we didn't think we could do. Right. Hangar 18 was the one of the early accomplishments for us. We were too dumb, or naive, I should say, not dumb, to realize we shouldn't be playing yeah. Hangar 18. <laughs> and we ended up playing it at Rock and Roll Limited. Yeah. And i w- glad no one has a video of it, but I kind of wish I could hear it. You know what? There's something to that being young and dumb. I yep. mean, that of just having you know, really no fear and you just go for it. Yeah. I have students like that when yeah. they want to play Cliffs of Dover, their second lesson. And I was thinking, well, we did the same thing. We just didn't know better to know our limitations. Yeah. And sometimes that's when people do great things because Mark brought that up one time. Mark Mullen about the Sex Pistols thinking about their first album. They couldn't do that if they're old and mature. You wouldn't sing half of those lyrics. I thought about that. I'm thinking when you're young, you'll say things you wouldn't say when you're yeah. 30 and you have responsibilities all of a sudden you can't say all those things so mm-hmm. there was a beauty to our naivety back then where we oh we want to play hangar 18 we're gonna do it big deal yeah when we could 
we did original stuff a little bit, I think. We're starting to sprinkle it in. But what other covers were we doing? Nothing nearly that hard. Mm, Ozzy stuff. Really? Yeah. What did we do? What did we do? Um, we did a lot of Metallica, of course. but Yeah, we did like Paranoid. Oh, okay. Yeah, Sabbath stuff. yeah you're right. Yeah, Sabbath stuff. Uh, yeah, I okay. Guess. We I didn't do any like the hard Ozzy stuff. We just did like. I was wondering, yeah. did we ever do? I remember I always wanted to do War Pigs, but I could never get the counts right, so That's we never right. did it. <laughs> Two E and a three yeah. E. That weird hit. That's funny how one thing can stop you from yep. wanting to do a whole song. Yeah, but I would love to find an old set list and th- oh, we did Peace Cells. Yeah, weird. That's right, Peace Cells. Anything else that kind of comes to mind? <sighs> Because our nemesis were Catharsis, and they did a lot of death metal-y stuff, but they also did old Black Sabbath, yeah. I remember. We did a lot of Metallica. I mean, yeah, that's right, true. Fade to Black, um, Ride the Lightning. From the Bell Tolls. From the Bell Tolls. We even did oh, um, Sandman the, at the Mirage. I have a video oh, of that yeah. somewhere. Um, Four Horsemen. Yep. Seek and Destroy. Seek and Destroy. We kind of... We kind of did the whole Metallica early catalog when we first got together. We even did No Remorse. Yep. Am I Evil? Mm hmm. So a lot of oh, Kill yeah. Them All stuff. Absolutely. So that's why it's funny when I do videos now of Metallica riffs because it's just old stuff that we used to do. It seems so <laughs> ancient. You got to blow the dust off of it and play it, but people still love it. Mm hmm. What was, besides Hangar 18, do you remember a more challenging cover we did? No. I'm trying to think of we what. We did Stairway to, <laughs> Stairway to Heaven Oh, once. yeah. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Do we actually practice it or yeah. what? No, okay. we, played it, we played it multiple times. Weird. It was just always, but it was, again, kind of half-assed. Like, like when do the drums come in? You know, it was just, I would always just be, like, looking at you. Like, Tell me when. <laughs> I just recently learned how that beat actually goes. Yeah. It's a weird count. <laughs> But I do recall doing that at Ryan's when we had to open for ourselves Oh yeah, for some reason. And we pulled it off. We played a bunch of covers and we pretended we were a different band before we came out. We did that at Ryan's? I think it was Ryan's. Well, we did that We did that at, what was it called? It was, it was like Solid Gold, but it was a different name. It was name. Clam like, Slam or something. That nope, type it thing. was on Payne Avenue down in St. Paul. Which was like right next to the the strip joint. We played the pain tr- reliever. Play- yeah, but that- it was right next door, and it was called something else. What? Rock and East Side. Oh, that's what it was called. And, and so w- that we opened for ourselves. Remember, we were Jimmy, Joey, JoJo, Shabadoo, Shabadoo or the something Simpsons like Simpsons reference. Yeah, that was there. How come I see us I, doing I'm, that at Ryan? Yeah, because because I remember my dad coming, and then we we wore like costumes like i had like some sort of wig on or, or something <laughs> and my dad didn't realize i don't know <laughs> but my dad didn't realize that was me playing when he walked he in he didn't oh at first. okay yeah he didn't recognize anyone so we in the might bed. have done that at another time I, I don't remember if we did it more than once i don't know that. why i recall only doing it stairway to heaven once at least but maybe we did do some cover set as a metallica band or something yeah i don't know what we I would have been know. a good metallica tribute band back then yeah <laughs> Although, I mean, I see like on YouTube now, there's some of these little kids that are just freaking amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's another just video idea I was having, like getting discouraged because you're working so hard on a song and then you see some four year old do it really well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Do you think they just started when they were born or do you think they had some prior life experience? They used to be another musician. Of no, some I kind? think what they, the experience they had was their parents. I think, that the, makes sense. I mean, I think that. You know, you think about what we learned, and all of a sudden we go, well, we got he- here, yeah. you know? And then you now have this kid coming up, and you go, hey, this person's kind of, he's kind of like like my son now is doing some drumming. I'm going, hmm, you know, <laughs> maybe I can get him going earlier and get him started and go, now I'm going to teach you some of the things I wish I would have learned. You That's know? true. Like. You're going to play piano, damn it. Yeah. <laughs> you know? All your insecurities come out. And yeah. You're going to do this. I wish yeah. I would have done that. That's like Parker and Tony. Parker comes in and plays Dream Theater pretty easily, whereas Tony was struggling for, for a while. Even though he could do it, it was yeah. a struggle. So it's this weird handing off the you know handing off the the flag or whatever for the next generation. Right. It's cool to see that. Yeah. I mean, I think that's more of it is you just – have somebody going, giving the confidence to this younger person and going, you know what? I've been there. 
try this, do this, do that, you know, and it doesn't have to be like a slave driver thing. Yeah. And, and it's, Although it, it is be. tricky because I think you do want to have, everybody wants their child to have their own life too. Mm-hmm. You know, you don't want to, Although it's in, in a lot of people live vicariously through their Tiger kid Woods children. dad. Yeah. yeah, exactly. John said that he grew up. Did he tie a golf club to Tiger's hands? As oh, a kid? yeah. Just to always have yeah. him comfortable Just, with it. But I think that was why he was playing. But uh, yeah, I don't know. There's that, lots of that, though. That's more toxic because then the kid has no choice. Yeah. And they have to follow through. I see that a lot with young daughters of dads that play guitar they come in and they want to learn or they pretend or they think they do and then they get old enough they get at that kind of scary age where they get more independent and suddenly they could care less about bass or guitar anymore but up until that point they wanted to be like their dad it's a way of connecting to their dad in a weird way so andre agassi is an interesting if you ever read his um (laughs) biography it's it's interesting to hear about like he he grew up really young playing and playing and then just like hated it and hated it and hated it and then fell in and out of love with tennis you know really but he was like forced to do it and at a really young age he got with I mean there was various coaches and they like he just was had this expectation put on him really young and and he was able to kind of rise to it but basically you can kind of look back at his career and see when he kind of hit the point of just like. I'm done. When and then, was that? Was and, that after he cut his hair or? No, it was, bef- well, it was probably when he cut his hair. Okay. It was probably <laughs> the moment like when he, when he went to Wimbledon and, and decided to not wear all the flashy colors and just wore white. I don't like, remember that. Yeah. Well, I was a big tennis fan, yeah. but, um, but there's a lot of that stuff. Like you just see, like, you just like decided, you know what? He was doing it always for other people. And then finally he decided to do it for himself. And then that's when he became the most successful ever for himself. Oh, know? he did better when he did that. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that. I thought yeah. he fell off and never recovered. Oh, no, no. He actually, I mean, because the thing of it was, is he was, his persona was better than he was a player. Okay. You know, like he was flashy, he had the long hair, he was the bad boy, and he had all the endorsements and everything. But he would, he would, he was good. But he wasn't winning major tournaments, and then all of a sudden he started to, to really kind of come around, and then decided just to like do this thing for himself, and then he started winning. That happens sometimes. Yeah. People who are the flashier, people get the endorsements, but they don't always follow through in the winnings. Yeah, even a guy like Conor McGregor, everyone knows his name. He mm-hmm. has hundreds of millions of dollars, but you saw last time we watched him fight, he lost. Yeah. But he's still really good when he loses. But I was trying to think of the whole – because I got into tennis for a while for some reason. Yeah. I would just watch Wimbledon and remember names. But was Pete he Sampras. around during the Pete Sampras days? Those Did, those two guys were like They the were the fighting. Guys. Yeah. Or they were but the Pete was a much better tennis player than Andre. Agassi. He seemed – here's what I liked about that. He seemed – I just went by looks. Like a bred tennis player, kind of the upper class player. Pete yeah. Sampras guy, whereas Andre seemed more like the rebel or something. Was totally that, okay. Totally, that's my assumption as well. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The, you could kind of see that where Pete was never like he would never show emotion like he was that. Calm you know, and cool yeah. He, or... I mean, he would get upset, but he was never. Yeah, he was always kind of relaxed and just like if something would go wrong, you could tell he would just be in his head. Where Andre Agassi would like throw his racket or you know, you know, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> was that his hero? I don't know about that. I'm not sure. Then I went through a whole Navratilova versus uh, who was? Um, let's see, Chris Everett. Yes, that was earlier. Okay, that was like that uh, was uh, I had a huge earlier. Crush like on Chris Everett. I'm trying to think, think of like the different women's player: Jennifer Capriati, who, Martina Hingis. Hingis, who's the really pretty girl? Something oh, S. Yeah, it's, that's a good example um, of somebody Sharapova. that was kind of a mediocre tennis player. Yeah, but she was so pretty. She pretty got all, and got a lot of endorsements. What was and, her first and name? She was good. Um, Sharapova. Maria, well, Shar- Maria Sharapova? Maybe. That sounds okay. right. Everyone loved right. her. Yeah. And she could do no wrong, but she could do wrong because yeah. she would lose. She was a little bit after, like um, – Oh gosh, Steffi Graf. That oh, that is she, that who I was thinking that's of? Who, yeah, and she's married to Andre Agassi now. Okay, which is their really kid's going to be crazy. Huh? Yeah, or is, are they already playing? I, oh, I would imagine that'd be funny if they hated tennis. They wanted to play. <laughs> they wanted to just. 
Well, you know what? That's an interesting thing. I feel like the, he mentioned some of that in his book, but um, because of, you know, just not wanting to pro- apply too much pressure to the kids because of. That's yeah. pretty smart. That's, oh, okay. I remember her. Yeah. She was always in Wimbledon. <laughs> she was <laughs> awesome. Isn't it funny? The names you remember. I always think 87 Twins. I can remember almost every one of their names, old pro wrestlers. If someone says Jimmy Superfly Snuka, suddenly <laughs> I remember all that. Yep. Is that because it was at an impressionable time? Because I could learn something yesterday and already forget the name now. It could be old it, age. It might be. But back, were you big into the twins, 87, 91? Yeah. Do you remember mm-hmm. when someone says Keith Atherton mm-hmm. or Jeff Reardon? Does it yeah, all come absolutely. back? Is that crazy? Yeah. Yep. And I'm thinking, I'm not that good with Juan names. Juan <laughs> What was it? The Berenger <laughs> Boogie? Oh. Or something. Well, yeah. Yeah. He had something like that. He was the guy that always, like, eat a plate of spaghetti before he would oh, play God. or whatever. He would carve and there up. was the snapper mow him down in. <laughs> That's right. And what's weird is the other day I saw a Twins game, and I think Burt Blylevin's still commentating, isn't he? He is, with yeah. Dick Bre- is it Dick Bremer? Yeah. Those guys have been doing it forever. Mm-hmm. Must have been twenty years or something. It's crazy. Bert's kind of taken. Um, he start. See, I wonder if he's like semi-retiring. He's not doing yeah. them all now. Okay, but like um, Justin Morneau is starting to do some of them, and um, Jack Morris is also doing them. Too. When you say Morneau, it's funny. You think about that run they had with them, Santana them. and all those really good guys, and you thought they could have. I think that was early two thousands. Yeah, I think Mar Morneau. What was Santana's first name? Johan. Okay, I kept saying Carlos. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, <laughs> very Johan similar. Yeah, yes. It's just shimmy that's, cocoa puffs. But besides tennis, like we would play tennis and have a little bit of that in common. But I was thinking about when we used to play tennis and we would always get Gatorade. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And I keep thinking how full of sugar Gatorade was, but it made you feel like you were a real athlete when you drank Gatorade. Oh yeah. So <laughs> it was really good marketing. Yeah, absolutely. But now when I do anything, it's just water or sometimes I'll even have a coffee before I do something strenuous. But I keep thinking, I wonder what would happen if I actually had another Gatorade, if I would just crumple and get, I guess you wouldn't get cramps because it's good for, for that stuff. Yeah. I love Gatorade, but for me, again, back back to circling back, yeah. the sugar thing, I had to stop that, you know? It's no just like Gatorade. it's just like all those things, like lemonade, you know, like things that you just like, oh, it's so good. You know, Grew you up go, on lemonade. Oh. It was the best thing when you ran in from a hot day yeah. as a kid. Or we used to always get these cans of orange juice concentrate oh, or Kool-Aid. Not or, Tang. We had Tang, too, oh, okay, yeah. showing my age. We had a big <laughs> Tang can. I think that stuff was made in the military or something, oh, wasn't it? Yeah, I yeah, it's something to do with Tang and, like, I don't know, being on the moon or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> if there's one thing we could thank NASA for, it's Tang. <laughs> but it was just powdered orange drink. Yeah. And then I thought how funny that is that grape flavor isn't really grape if you think about it we just learn it as being grape Grape drink grape drink yeah and grape jelly just made with corn syrup but we used to walk as kids to food and fuel and we would get so many terrible things that were blue oh yeah (laughs) what is blue there's nothing really that's blue in nature and we're drinking this blue drink called something berry and it's just all we were raised on artificial stuff no wonder why we love it yeah that's interesting. But I think the idea is to be bored with what you eat. I hate to say that. Just find excitement somewhere else maybe. Well, that that's a that's a, that's an interesting topic right there cuz I've been talking about that with about our kids and like my dad like for example, like anytime we he wants to like take them on a wagon ride, you know, like so go, oh we're going to go for a wagon ride and then he'll go, "Okay, now let's grab some snacks to bring along with that, you know, okay. we're going to get you some milk and we're going to get you some cookies." And we're going to go on a wagon ride. And it's just like they're going to attach those two in their brain. That that's how I grew up and yeah. that's how my dad is. And and it's it's exactly it. It's like you shouldn't you know, you shouldn't attach emotions to food. It's powerful. But, but we that. yeah, but we do. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, some of my f- when I want to celebrate or do something good, we go to Roos Chris and and have a really fancy steak or feel we, that you know, stuffed feeling. Yeah, yeah. And, and and it's like you know, hey, let's celebrate. Let's very. I don't even know. Like, when would you ever have a celebration without food? I mean, that's. But yet, 
you could you could you could go to the beach and and celebrate by like you know hanging out in the water or whatever yeah. and doing stuff but other physical not, not my world i mean if we go on a pontoon we're talking about the menu that we're going to bring out on the boat to we cook. used to bring buckets of kfc on the yeah. pontoon for <laughs> yeah. sure yeah so it, that's that's pavlovian pavlov's yeah. dog stuff going on there. it's interesting yeah it's so you know connecting that with happiness with food that's, that's yep you nailed it and that's how we are as humans we're creature like in that way so this one guy that I listen to, he talks about getting treats all the time. And the more he says that, the more I get kind of gross inside because I think, what are you, a dog? Yeah. Like, treats. Do I get my treat? I did my trick. And that bugs me because I know how that feels to want a reward of some kind and call yeah. it a treat. Even though I know a treat can be anything. Yeah. But I think of treat as, you did a good thing, here you go. And the other day I was at Barnes & Noble and this mom walks in with her daughter and they made a beeline to the cafe. It was funny. And the girl had this cute little coupon and she was all happy and stuff. But you could already tell she was a little heavier and everything. And the mom's like, well, she's just here to get her treat because it's her birthday. And the girl was like, I want that donut and that cookie and that. And I try so hard not to judge because I have my vices. Look yeah. at what I'm drinking now. Yeah. But I just felt like the mom, I'm judging, was putting the daughter behind the eight ball already by saying treat and by making a happy moment attached to eating a sugar cookie. Yeah. And then I thought when that girl gets older and she starts feeling lonely or scared, she's going to find comfort in devouring something that's totally. terrible for her. Totally. You know, we but, do that at a young age with kids. I mean, if you're good through this, you know, if you sit good in church, we'll go have ice cream after yep. church or, or we'll go to Cold Stone. Whatever it is. Yes. Yeah. yeah. It's tricky. Cause, I mean, if you get, oh, you got a good you a report card, you know, let, let me take you out for this or, you know, I mean, yeah. So we're trained like almost mice in a laboratory, which is weird. Yeah. And you got to wonder, is it just because they they're, the parents were taught that way too? Where did it start? Happy birthday. Here's a cake. Yeah. Right. <laughs> it's like right away. <laughs> we're going to go to Chuck E. Cheese. Yeah. And there's nothing good at Chuck E. Cheese, you know. You have fun, but well, it's, there's a ball pit there. At least there's something to. Uh, you know how many church? No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there's always something bad to look at. I re oh, what was it? The first time I started realizing I'm not a germaphobe, but that a lot of kid stuff is really disgusting when you really oh, think yeah. about it. I was a kid, and we did a party, and there was a bobbing for apples pan or whatever yeah and the girl that went no it was a boy went before me stuck his face in there and he's like arr, 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 and all i see is spit and snot coming out of his nose <laughs> and all i could think is was i'm next after this <laughs> kid's done i have to stick my face in that oh it was so gross yeah and then i thought about birthday cakes when kids Oh. blow all the candles oh, yeah. out and the kid was just coughing spitting, over, spitting yeah. and and i got a little germaphobia once in my life and yeah. you got that way once like i did with uh what do they call that ocd where you have to i had to touch if i touched the wall yeah. with one hand i had to touch with the other yeah. hand yeah and you, i think you said you had something like that oh yeah but i, I it wasn't germ stuff related it was success related so like, like superstition if things was going well in my life I, I felt like if I didn't, if I didn't do whatever popped in my head right then, that things wouldn't go as well anymore. In so, sports? Uh, anything. Oh. Anything. But I know you <laughs> get really deep at that. Yeah. But like, for example, it could be as simple as you're going down a railing, down the steps. And if you don't, when you're about to leave the railing, if you don't touch the railing with your other hand, yeah. it all of a sudden you're going to walk outside and get hit by a car or something. You, or you you know, you know, could just... Or something as innocuous is. as touching your if ear. If you go or step on a rug and you move the rug, you got to move the rug back into its position. Whoa. Otherwise, the whole time when you're walking away, you're thinking about how that's going to make something bad for you later. Like, what just... It could be just simple stuff. And... Yeah, that's like you can go crazy with that stuff, and people do. Yeah, and you know what? I still I I found it though. I've over the years I still have some of that, but I try to try to keep it like 
keep it in check a little bit and I try to just use it as like a way to make myself better. Do you reason with you yourself know? or do you just force yourself not to do it? Do you have to sit and think, okay, if I step on a crack, I'm not really going to break my mom's back or do you just say, right. fuck it, I'm not going to do this. I'm just going to walk right through this, right through the floor. It depends on the situation. I think sometimes, yeah, it's hard to say. Sometimes when things are just going well, like you just, you you got your job is going good, you got a raise, you got whatever, family's good or whatever, then then those kind of things I tend to just answer whatever I need to do, <laughs> you know? Um, it might be biological because as humans we notice when things are good and I think we're, our brain says you're doing the right stuff at the moment. Yeah. And you want to keep doing that as a pattern. Yeah. And if all of a sudden you break that pattern, you, you think – the consequence is going to be the opposite. Yeah. For me, though, like it would never be so obsessive where it would put me in danger or something like that. You know, like, like you have would, to turn the car wheel to the left because yeah, you just turn it yeah, to the right. Yeah, yeah. Like uh, to me, it would be like, duh, you're dumb. Don't do that. Yeah. You know, it's always just little stuff. You know, like put the pen down a certain way or have wow. to. You know, like those kind of things. Yeah, it's weird. Some of the best athletes have that issue. I I think it's. Might have been in a movie, but they're talking about guys who don't change their under. That was Ace Ventura, I think. Because <laughs> he thinks flies are lucky. Yeah. But you wear your favorite shirt or your lucky shirt. I did that once at sure. a jujitsu review match where I had to try to get my next belt. I wore this rash guard. It's it's like a tight sure. Under Armour type thing. And I thought, last time I wore this, I did really well. And the funny thing is, is it worked. Yeah. So you get reinforcement and you want to yeah. keep doing it. Yeah. But the funny thing is, on a here we go with bro, bro science. Would you go deep and deep into you ever, ever read about quantum physics, the deeper stuff that a lot of people can't even explain about something existing in two places till you observe oh, it, then it actually a little bit, not much. I always wonder if the slightest thing you do, like I just moved this water bottle. If now the path I'm going down is a different reality than the old path sure. that would have been there. Sure. And I wonder if that path would have been, healthier for me or if suddenly now I'm going to end up dead somehow. Right. Yeah. But isn't that childish in a weird way? Is that sort of how you get over it? You just think this is just stupid stuff. Yeah. I think to some degree, you just, when you get older, you just go, or you just go, I don't have time for that. I'm too tired or just <laughs> too move on, you know, what's um, an example of something you've done recently like that? Mm. Cause I just did something now. Yeah. Well, you know, I was going to say though, I feel like in some of it is to help keep myself sharp in, in like ways of like, you know, being an audio engineer and being, having to be really detail oriented yeah. in a lot of scenarios. Um, if I notice something's out of place or I notice that, you know, the fact that I noticed I went down a railing and I didn't touch it with one hand means I'm always analyzing something, you know? So, which is the way I am when, anytime I hear something, anytime I hear like that fan that's in the room where like, you know, hearing it come from there from a, and have a, a different frequency. Like I'm always analyzing that's cool. everything. You're in tune that with that. I have a disclaimer for the air conditioner and that is I'd rather have a little white noise in the background and have you comfortable than no. Cause I thought about shutting it off. Oh, and I yeah. thought what'll happen is the room will get hot and people won't want to stick around long. Yeah. So I'm sacrificing it until I upgrade someday, but very, oh, uh, very sharp of you to notice as an engineer, oh, you yeah. know that you can't have a freaking vent above yeah. the microphones, but <laughs> no, I listen but, uh, to it in the I, car and it's, it's, okay. Oh, I totally agree. Like, I think for this kind of stuff, it's all about hanging out near the living room, kind of just chatting. You yeah. Know? I wanted yeah. to feel, I actually had these lights on for the last two podcasts and it feels a little too, I hate making people feel like they're under, I have a lamp in your yeah. face and I'm yeah. cross examining you or something. Right. This feels maybe too chill. I don't know. Depends, but it, it has a good. good feel. Like yeah. maybe the chairs could be more comfortable, but I don't want people to be too comfortable either because then maybe it's sort of a thing where these chairs at least keep you sitting up straight. If there's a backrest, sure. people might sit way back <laughs> and get a little too relaxed. I don't know. What do you think? No, I like it. It's good. At first I thought it was going to feel a little weird, but it feels good. Yeah. yeah. What's your what would be the perfect situation for you think? 
where you'd feel comfortable talking. Well, you know what? I was just looking, thinking about the only thing I would change mm-hmm. is now it's off. But when we first started, I could see the record. Especially for uh, you. Yeah. Yeah. You're and waiting. I could see it running through. Yep. And all of a sudden, I started to think about what I was going to say before I would say it. <laughs> You know, I would now keep, that the screensaver is on, I can't see that anymore, so it doesn't even matter. Well, I kept looking at it the first podcast because we were going three hours, and I was thinking, when is it finally going to just stop? Yeah. So I was really paranoid looking back and <laughs> forth. So I thought, I better just dim the screen a little bit. Yeah. And the funniest thing happened, we went three hours, and I looked, because I had the zoom way out, so it was super small. At the very end, there was blankness blank space after I'm thinking we ran out of pro tools yeah so you get right to the end tape. whatever it is and it was just blank but then I refreshed it and it came back oh, so I thought just to redraw I don't think you could ever run out of pro tools unless you ran out of space right yeah well there there is a limitation on how long a file can be oh really um but it's really long yeah will it just skip to another thing or will it stop I think I, I think if you go to because it's on a 24-hour time code I think if you went over 24 hours, it would oh. probably stop. So you get like a Y2K type thing where yeah. it gets a number. And it doesn't <laughs> I guess I've never proved, proved that. We're thinking would maybe the that? next dream. Because you can do a 24-hour offset. And so, man, maybe it wouldn't stop. Maybe, I don't know. I wonder what the longest uninterrupted Pro Tools track ever was. Whoever recorded Mark Malman's marathon or something. Yeah, right. Four days. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. But it comforts me to know that even if everything gets screwed up, I at least have the Zoom and I yeah. can some <laughs> upload something, which is good. Yeah. Um, there's going to be a lot more of these in the future because I have a lot of fun doing this now. I yeah. learned a lot. I've learned so much in three podcasts. It's crazy. That's awesome. And it's all been with my friends, which makes it easy to get into. If I was sitting here with someone I didn't know, yeah. I'd be a little more nervous. I'd be like Chris Farley. <laughs> but it feels like... Every time we come back, it's going to be new stuff because we have a lifetime of all these experiences. Oh, yeah. We barely touched on old metal band stuff or how we met and all that. Mm-hmm. But I want to eventually tell people how we <laughs> – I forgot who knew you, but you found Corey for us because you were like you were enemies with, with him at one time and almost got in a fight. Or you picked I think it was him. the opposite. I think because I think – Corey found me. Oh, so we found Corey somehow. Yeah, I think so. I don't. Must have been Alex. I don't think I knew how to find Corey. Boy, that, you know, guess, Corey probably remembers it like really well. Yeah. Um, I can't think of a mutual friend between us and Corey. I don't know. I can't remember how that worked out. But for some reason, I thought I thought it was like you guys, you three, and then. Well, we did get, you're right, we did get together with Corey first, and then got together with you, and I thought you were really cool because you had a double bass kit. Yeah. (laughs) And a place to practice and all that. But when we first met Corey somehow, we were walking through my neighborhood, and we tried to get him to walk into a stranger's house and set up and start jamming. Yep. So we were were really mean back then. But I was like, (laughs) Corey, that's our house. Just go in, go to the basement, and just start playing. Warm up will be there in a few minutes, and he didn't fall for it. Oh, my gosh. But then he knew you because you guys used to sort of be enemies, right? Maybe. I don't don't know. I don't really remember that. Because you you mentioned – I thought you mentioned – almost fighting with him and then you changed after you got bullied by not with him okay i've had that i've had that with um certain situations where early on i was a bully and then got bullied and then that changed everything eighth grade or it would have been seventh grade okay we all we all got bullied by the bully that you got bullied yeah exactly (laughs) and and it's like soon as that happens it's like you're like you can feel what you've been doing to other people. And it's like, that changed my life. And it was like, now I look back on it and go, God, that was like the worst time of my life, but it was also the best thing that ever happened to me. Isn't that weird? Because after that, then I would look for people that were bullying people. And you I became would go, a hero. I would go, well, I don't know about that, but I would try to get right in the face of somebody else that was bullying somebody because it, it's crazy. You did a 180 yeah. completely. Yeah. Yeah, it was like in a... Less than a school year that it took for me to go from sixth grade being the top of my school to all of a sudden going to the bottom of the next school because it was a junior high. Okay. So 
And then Mr. Peterson, the bully, was uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'll name names. He 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 was kind of a weird blessing because he put the fear of God in everybody and yeah. it straightened everybody out. It yep. like. And you know, my favorite thing to do at that point was play tennis. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, he was on the damn tennis team. This is like a bad movie. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Exactly. It's like Karate Kid with the uh, it playing is. soccer. Yeah, he was <laughs> totally like the guy in Karate Kid. He yep. even looked like Johnny. Yeah. And exactly. what, what year was the tennis when he was on the team? What what year was it? Or was it a, like throughout junior high? Oh no, it was seventh. It was my seventh grade year, so I don't remember whatever year that would That's have been. That's a tough year for everybody. Yeah. Seventh yeah. grade. Yeah, I mean, already just going into a new big big school with all these people, and, but but yet having the ego like you were the top of the school coming from sixth grade. It's always a hierarchy. In my last, when I was in sixth grade, I had just moved from fifth grade to sixth grade. I moved to a new house. And then I, so I was the new guy in, in my school when I was in elementary school. That was good or not good? Well, it, it ended up being a good thing, but cause I was new. Everybody thought I was like the coolest guy around. The mysterious guy. Yeah, exactly. Which I wasn't, but everybody <laughs> thought I was. And so I just ran with it and was probably cocky as hell, you know? Yeah. Um, I remember picking on other people and it was just like, it was horrible. And, An ego unchecked at that age is very deadly. Very, yeah. not deadly, but just really yeah. dangerous. It's, and it's, it's weird to even think, go back now and I think of like being in sixth grade and like trying to deal with all that kind of stuff, you know? It's well, like, you don't even know who you are yet and everyone's kissing your ass. And so you get this bigger, yeah. like they say, your head gets bigger. And next thing you know, you meet someone who can pop that balloon. Yep. And, and thank, thankfully for me, it didn't. It happened really fast. You yeah. Know? It was in seventh grade. I mean, like that could have happened in ninth grade go, going into 10th grade or something. And Might not have stuck me. as much maybe. Well, or I could have been a jerk or an asshole for that many <laughs> years longer. <laughs> Two more you know? years of that. <laughs> yeah. People are know. plotting to kill you. Yeah. <laughs> well, I remember being the, I hate, I never say I'm the victim of something, but of two pieces of terrible advice from two father figures. <laughs> And one of them was my my real dad, who I remember him saying, if you're ever in a situation where you need the upper hand, you just kind of puff up your chest. This is like old generation <laughs> talk. Puff up your chest, walk right up and say, you got a fucking problem, kid. And you'll see, they'll just walk away or whatever. And so I did that one time and I was sort of turning into like what you said, you're sort of a terror. And this was, I think, sixth grade or seventh grade. And I told this kid that I wanted this seat at the lunch table and he wouldn't move. So I did the old, you got a problem kid. And he stood up to me and I oh, remember yeah. I was You're so like, embarrassed. Oh, now what? I had no plan B. <laughs> so I sort of went, well, yeah, it's your lucky, it's that old thing. It's your yeah. lucky day. And I walked away and then I realized I was faking the whole time. Yeah. And the second worst piece of advice was from my stepdad. And he said, there was a girl who was dating somebody and I liked her but she was seeing him and he, his advice, <laughs> this is funny because you would never give this advice to anyone now. He said, go up to that girl and say, dump that loser. Come with me. That kind of thing. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't go up and say it to her, but I wrote her a letter. Oh boy. Dump that loser. And it's so funny because she never talked to me after that and they ended up getting married. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the lesson I learned and awesome. to this day. I'm so sorry that I ever did that. It wasn't me. It wasn't me. Oh gosh. But either way, that's how you learn. Might that's be a good funny. story to end this with. <laughs> that's great. But I think for the next thing, uh, I don't know. What are you up to now? Real quick. You got a gig coming up, running sound for a school function. <laughs> yeah. It's not a school function. It's it's some sort of a function happening at a school, but it's a concert going on. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I've got that going. I've got... Um, on Friday night, where I'm doing this band called Lonesome Losers. Oh yeah, the uh, Yacht Rock Yacht Rock tribute. Uh, half band. Heartless yeah. bands going there to see it. Yeah, great. That's cool. Which is another band you run sound for Heartless. Yep, yep. So we're doing them on Friday night. Are um, they going to play uh, Christopher Cross? And yeah, all that? I hope so. I'll be oh. up there singing with them. <laughs> You'll be doing the Michael McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do 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 do. <laughs> Lonesome Losers. So a lot of A440 stuff. Um, yeah, that's what, coming up. And then I've got um, multiple sessions at my studio as, through the weekend as well. And 
next week, and I'm kind of trying to wrap up a few things to go on a fishing trip at the end of the month. So. Good. All yep. this while having kids and a wife and yep. everything. <laughs> yep. When that all came. It seems like yesterday that we were at my old space across the street here, and I remember very vividly my YouTube channel just started taking off. And then you telling me that you've been trying to have kids and I, it just hit me like, what? I never knew you wanted yeah. all that stuff. And <laughs> now it's all here. Yeah. That's weird. Yeah. Now it's, I mean, 16 months in now and we're trying to kind of get somewhat of a normal life back together. Yeah. Now. Piece it you all know, together. Yeah. And yeah. A lot of, a lot of. I mean, the hurdles. new normal, but you know, at least some things that, you know, I love to fish. I love to go to Canada and do some of that stuff and. I didn't do any of that last year, but that was just because it was a whirlwind of a year. And you finally so, passed the the hump, probably. Yeah, I think so. I okay. mean, there's always going to be things there. I mean, there's, you know, you talk to parents, and they know, once you get kids, it's not about the you know yourself anymore. It's it's about them. That's why I can't have kids. I'm too selfish. <laughs> yeah, but I, but hear I mean, you everybody's got to figure out to be sane. You got to figure out still a way to reward yourself and do things. And, and I think that's what I'm trying to do a little bit, you know, trying to do it and not feel too guilty about it. I was going to ask, <laughs> is a fishing trip going to feel different now when you're sitting there thinking, should I be home or is this just what I need to be normal when I go back and be a better Yeah, it, it, it is a little weird to like, cause you feel guilty cause you like leave, you know, your wife home or whatever, or somebody else to handle all the, I mean, having twins and kids is, it's a lot of a lot of extra, a lot of work and it's just, you know, you don't want somebody else to get just depressed because you're gone. You know, I struggle with that with working too. I mean, being able to, every time I'm at work means I'm leaving my wife alone and having to handle all that stuff. But she's on summer vacation though, right? She is. Yeah. But still, so who cares? You need to, if kidding. you're home all day with the kids, just all the time, there's, you need to have a mental break at some point. I mean, because it's just wine and Xanax. That's all yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's. But no, we're, it's good. Things are great. Especially to go from nothing to twins. Yeah. And then having all those crazy things happen at once that to get through that, you must feel like stronger from it. Or do you feel lucky or does it make you more superstitious? <laughs> <laughs> what did I eat for breakfast that day that happened? Yeah. No, I, I, you know, I, I think pretty, I feel good about it all, you know, going through what we've gone through and, and, um, we, I'm generally try to look on the bright side of everything. And, and I think we are on the bright side of things. Things are going well. And, um, so, I mean, I feel great. You know, it's, it's, ama it's amazing how time flies. I mean, if you rewind a year ago, things for us was pretty unstable and, you know, lots of medical stuff going on with the kids and. And so now we're much more stable and it's like learned a lot from that process and also learned to appreciate a lot of things as well. You and John Pepke, I think are the best examples of going through a bunch of stuff and then coming out a little more transparent. And that's a good thing before you're really sure of yourself and you have all these personality traits. But then I remember talking to both of you over food, actually, we're just eating and talking. <laughs> of course. And there's, <laughs> we're rewarding ourselves. And I remember John said, he was the first one that I noticed this happened to. He said, there's just a time where I let go and I was so tense that I had to do that or I'd go crazy. So it was good to see him let go. And he had this peace in his eyes that he never used to have. And I thought he went through some shit and that's what made Ugh. him where he is now. It's, a, it's like you leveled up in life. Yeah. And suddenly things that used to bother you don't bug you so much because you've already been through a lot of that. It's like people go through near-death experiences. Yeah. All of a sudden, having one little thing happen during the day doesn't derail you anymore because of that. I wish I could say that. Um, you know, <laughs> there, I get your point. And yeah, there are some of these bigger things. Like sometimes I've noticed like just big things will happen in life and then and you just kind of go, okay, I'm just going to – you go into fix-it mode, you know. But it's still now with having kids when you're you're kind of always on go with the kids and they're running around doing things and and just not settling down at all. It's like little stupid things can like pop up and you're amazed by like how 
you can't handle something really low. <laughs> like stepping on a Lego or something. Is that why all yeah, Paris gets yeah. so mad about that? <laughs> no, it's like little, I mean, yeah, those kind of things. It's more about not stepping on the Lego. You're thinking who didn't pick that Lego up? Cause I step, why did I step on it? Why was it there? And then you look at your wife going, you could have picked up that Lego and you, oh, you don't say that, but you're thinking about it. You're <laughs> thinking that. And then you're going, you know what? I should have probably picked up the Lego, <laughs> you know, but this, you don't think of it at the time because you just pissed off and you're like, you have not enough sleep or or whatever, and you just later on you go like ten minutes later you're going, oh my gosh, I can't believe all that went through my head, you know. Well, you're a different person when you're either hungry or tired and all that oh, yeah. or stressed. Suddenly you bite back, but I always uh, remember. <laughs> maybe we should leave on this story. It all comes back to the the time your mom was vacuuming. Remember that? Well, yes. <laughs> and she started trying to run you over. Or something. And you, you're what you tell the story. Okay. <laughs> oh boy, we're going we're going down. Sorry, Let's see. I'm, sorry, I'm trying to you. think of what what grade I was in at that point. It was like seventh or eighth grade or something. Maybe ninth. I think it was seventh. Anyways, it was like the dead of winter, and um, was going to a snowmobile race. And I was leaving to go out the door. My mom was vacuuming and she said, make sure you grab your boots. And I was like, I'm not grabbing my boots. You know, I'm not taking my boots. And it's like, I look back now and you're like, what a dumbass! You're gonna go out to a snowmobile race on a lake and not bring your boots. Grab your damn moon boots. Yes, exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but for some reason, I was just not having it. And. And she got the most mad I've ever seen her at seen at me, and she started. She ran after me with the vacuum. <laughs> She's I'm picturing that as I'm like trying to get out the door, and she and and I know now that that there was other. I'm sure that there was other things that I had done that little resentment. she was pissed off about. But instead of of confronting me and talking about those things. She chased after me, after me because I wouldn't bring the boots. I wouldn't wear the boots out there. Was but it one here, of those big old fashioned scary vacuums with a big light in the front? <laughs> no, like, oh gosh, like a Kirby. <laughs> no, I don't think it was. I think it was a little more modern than that. But and I, I don't know if she actually even touched me with it. I don't know, but it it was just it was hilarious. But it, at the time, it was like she was really, really mad. Yeah. And my mom's a really laid back person. So all of a sudden to foresee her get mad at me about that. But what did I do? I left without the boots. I said, Nope, I'm not doing it. I put my foot down. Right. So here's the best part of the story. So then I go to this race with friends and we're hanging out and my parents come to the race too. And so they meet up and, you know, we're like, okay, what's going on? Well, my feet were freezing. <laughs> so, but you couldn't let them know. Well, guess who brought the boots in the car? Oh, that's sweet. So my mom brought the boots in the car. And so I had to do the walk of shame with my mom. <laughs> we walked back to the car together as I'm talking about how my feet were cold and how I was sorry for being so, <laughs> so oh. mean. And so... I went and put the boots on, and that was kind of the end of that thing. But to this day, we once a year we bring up that that whole situation. It's a classic. Yeah, it was just like you know, that's you, the there's stuff, a lot of lessons there. At that's that the stuff point. you'll always remember about her and just <laughs> growing up. And now that you're a parent, you'll probably have a few of those moments. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to put on a jacket. You, you still don't want them, even though your mom may have wanted you to feel a little more pain, maybe maybe a little frostbite or something. In the end, she was. That's so crazy. She still yeah. brought them. Yep. Oh yeah. Well, that's 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 my mom. She's yeah. always thinking of others, and and you know, and also a little bit of like always wanting to be right too. Yeah, you know? there's that. <laughs> but, but that's a that's a good thing. I get that too from her. But probably because she's into accountant stuff and yeah. numbers and all that, she has to have that part of her brain. I'm yep. right. This is actually the right way to do it. Yep. Well, both your parents have always been awesome. Even though we were young kids, punk kids, eating all their food every practice. Your dad and mom never gave us shit ever. Even though I broke your dad's guitar once, yeah. the input. <laughs> I think I lo what did I, I did a bunch of bad stuff, and then he was always so cool. And even to this day, when I talk to him, they act like super close, oh, yeah. just almost like relatives to me. Yep. It's crazy. Yeah. So I like that. That was a good story to end with. I didn't know. <laughs> 
<laughs> at least she wasn't driving a car at the time when she was mad oh, at yeah. you. Oh, yeah. A vacuum is, is a good thing to learn a lesson <laughs> from, not a car. That's great. 